Hey people, you are live with King Sigma. This is an impromptu stream. This was um, inspired by a conversation that Edward Anderson was having on his channel. I uh, came in on the tail end of that discussion. And in the, in, during the portion of his conversation that I listened to, probably like the last 30 to 45 minutes, he was talking about you know, the, uh, the marriage marketplace in the sexual marketplace in uh, modern America. And there was some brothers in the chat that seemed like they wanted to continue the conversation. So if you're out there, um, you wanna continue the conversation that we were having on Edward's uh, stream, definitely let me know and I can uh, send you the link or you can contact me. I'll put my uh, information in the chat. So that would be King Sigma one, two, three at gmail.com. So if you were someone that was in that chat and you wanted to extend the conversation that we were having on Edward's uh, channel, let me know. I have a few uh, thoughts that I'd like to share because um. When I was in the chat, I was putting some things in there about the cheating. You know, I've read a lot about infidelity in America. And like I said on the last stream that I had, and that discussion was about yellow is the new black and the growth of the Asian population. As you know, with the census report, it's a big ass report to get through, man. So I, I got through the racial demographics piece and I found the part about Asians being on a path to surpass black Americans either sometime between 2030 and 2035. But another statistic that showed and that's been discussed in the mainstream media that was in the 2020 census was that the marriage rate in America is the lowest that has been in 150 years or something to that extent. And it's interesting because when you go back, you say, okay, 150 years. So that means it was low uh, 150 years ago. And you go back and you find out that there was a big um, anti-marriage movement amongst American men. Shout out to the brother Wagner's. Appreciate you, uh, the super sticker brother. Um, so there's, this isn't the first time. And in fact, the more that I study history, the more I, when I'm looking at modern day problems, I have to go back to like classic writing, specifically like the fall of Rome, um, the, the, the decline of the West by Oswald Spengler. So Edward Gibbons, Oswald Spengler, are two historians that I've studied because they, they, they have these theories about the cycles of Western civilization. And basically they talk about there being four seasons. Some say they last um, like 250 years, others 500, but basically there's this idea that the birth of a, a beautiful civilization where there's writing, where there's law, where there's opportunities for citizens to reach their fullest potential and it depends on the system, what they define it as, but that's those are hallmarks of civilization. The written word, um, the written laws, those are two of the fundamental aspects and the way that they uh, have their hierarchies that are put in place supposedly to create a system that gives benefit to the greatest people. Now, some think from a top-down level, others think from a bottom-up level. So we've had different systems, as we know. Um, collectivist societies are the oldest societies. We've had theocracies, we've had monarchy, aristocracies. We have the modern oligarchy and we've had the democratic republics and the pure republics. So this isn't nothing new, the, this relationship and this dynamic between um, men and women in the West. And certain conditions come about that the more freedom that men and women have and the more the options that they have to do whatever it is that they're doing, people tend to take what's the best option that they believe to themselves or specifically what brings the most pleasure because that's big too. So, you know, human beings, we like to escape pain and we run towards pleasure. So when we talk about this, this modern marriage in the West. I mean, when you think about the history of America, at least, it's probably um, the most sexually liberated um, America that we've had since the, the, this, this nation was called the United States of America. So we're talking the late 1780s. So at least since then, because 
you know, in like the 1700s, 1800s, they had like the Victorian age over there in England. And England had a big influence on the United States. But people got to ask, well, why did they have this Victorian age of conservatism? Well, it came about because it was on the heels of a licentious moment in the history of Britain and France and things of that nature. So they had times when it was very sexually liberated and it had a, a certain period of time that people embraced it, but then they found that it caused too much instability within the society, breakdowns of the family, but more importantly, you had like, specifically in Europe, you had lots and lots of orphans that were, they had orphan epidemics at certain times, you know, back in that day, because there was so much looseness between the men and women of that day and they weren't gonna marry each other and they didn't have the birth control that we have today. So they had like big orphan problems. So the state usually starts to step in more and more into the private doings of the um, private family as more and more responsibility that should be left to the mom and fathers, the dads and the mothers of children. So as people become more and more irresponsible, that puts more responsibility on the state to step in. Because what will happen is that society will see more and more abandoned children. There will be certain breakdowns in society because there is no stable family and the state will start to step in to take measures to um, change the culture um, from one of looseness to one of more of a strict morality. And that's why religion has been around since the, you know, the beginning of time for men. But it's during certain times that people are more religious and less religious. And as people become more and more uncomfortable with chaos and the freedoms that they have, they don't know what to do at that time, they start to ask the state or other institutions to define life for them. Because without it, they don't really have a mission statement. So I think what's going on in America is that freedom has never been free. And with freedom, it requires that you take on responsibility of that freedom. Meaning that in order to have more freedom, you're gonna have less state interference. So you're gonna have to be more wiser about what you do with your time and your resources as you engage in a more free state. But for some people, they just don't have that kind of discipline that's needed. And they need the church to step in and to give them order, to give them definition for life and to give them a mission statement. And others, they want even a stronger hand, the government to step in and create specific boundaries that the citizens must live within. But then there's a smaller group and it's almost always a smaller group that are capable of governing themselves for the most part, capable of giving themselves a mission statement and capable of exercising the discipline and wisdom needed to survive with a lot of freedom. So that was kind of my, you know, my take. Uh, shout out to the brother Fast Attack Tough. Appreciate you, brother. So I'm listening to uh, Edward's stream and he's making some good points. And you know, there's a lot of people, I think he had like 300 people watching. So there were a lot of people in the chat and this topic of cheating came up and you know, I always hear this conversation about cheating, but it's always said, you know, just on the surface. And I see the brother Edward Anderson is he's in the chat. Shout out to that brother. He was doing big numbers. Hey, Ed, if you um, if you got time, because I know you said you were busy and you couldn't come on, but you had such a good conversation going there. I'm down for like 90 minutes of this discussion because I really want to get into this cheating thing. So you hit me up at King Sigma one, two, three at Gmail dot com. If you got like 30 minutes to spare, because. I think you were really on to something that needs to be discussed more, especially when I bring up this chart that I've been looking at for a couple of weeks. So um, there's there's a chart that I want to show show you all, and then I'll kind of get in get back into like what Edward was talking about over there, and why this whole cheating conversation it, it's it's always talked about, but it's never specified what the actual sec sexual marketplace is in combined with what cheating really is like, cause when you use that word cheating, in order to cheat, you have to be in a, in a relationship, in a committed relationship where both parties say, we're in a committed, single, single committed relationship that, that is not a open relationship. We're in a closed relationship, a closed um, monogamous relationship, right? But the data tells us that that group of Americans is at the lowest point that it's ever been at in 150 years or so. So the point that I was making in Edward's chat is that, so we talk about this cheating dynamic. 
But what we have in America, again, we have a large, large supply of uncoupled people. Now, when you specifically talk about black Americans, we're talking about 60 to 70 percent or something of black women that are um, uncoupled, unwed. And you're talking about 52, 53 percent of black men that are unwed. So when we talk about cheating, we're talking about a very small group of Americans that can fit into that definition. And I'm going to show you how through this data, how this cheating idea is a contradiction. Oh, yeah. definitely. Oh, yeah. Obsidian's there. I, <laughs> matter of fact, I think that he was the one that provoked the conversation. So I, I definitely want Obsidian to come up here. So Obsidian, uh, the email is kingsigma123 at gmail.com. So give me about 15, 20 minutes. So I kind of want to go into this data to give context to what I'm going to bring to this conversation. And then you guys can bring your opinions as well. But um, so, yeah. So we talk about this cheating thing again. You have such a large percentage of Americans that are uncoupled and the dynamic plays out with single people. It plays out with married people. So when we talk about men cheating, here's one of the problems that I saw looking at some of the data on cheating. Let's say you have one married man. Right. But he has 10 concubines. So he's cheating with 10 different women. But he's only one man. But if there's a group of 10 men. There might be nine men that aren't even getting a date, let alone cheating. And they can't cheat because they're not in a relationship. Because, again, the problem is that one man out of the group of 10, he has one wife. And he might have nine concubines. While those nine men, they're on the outside looking in. They're on the Internet looking for guidance from other men. While that one man, he don't need no guidance because he has the qualities that are highly desirable in the modern woman. Now, there's so much information out there about women's dating preferences, their sexual mores in 2021. I can't go a day without seeing an article from a woman talking about how she wants certain traits in a man. And no matter how many times smart men tell them, hey, if you want that, okay, for example, in the chat, a brother K-Dot was asking me a question about a caller into another person's show. So there was a white dude who was 6'3", 220 pounds, and he weighed 100, and he made $100,000 plus, right? But he couldn't understand. I'm sure he was being facetious asking this question to black men, but he was asking him, why do black women approach him? You see what I'm saying? But that's an example of what I mean. So that's a rare man in America to have to meet those standards, to be 6'3", fit, making over 100K, and he's white because there's a hierarchy in America. Now, he said the women were approaching him, okay? Now, I call that, and I got to shout out to brother Alan Roger Curry because I know if I say his name, a bunch of people are going to show up, <laughs> you know? But ARC has the mode one, two, three, and four. But there's something else that I say mode zero, and what that guy was describing is mode zero. Mode zero is when you have the kind of qualities, looks, money, status, and charisma. One of those four, three of those four, two of those four, one of those four. But mode zero, and I this is in honor of ARC because he has one through four. I say mode zero is when you turn the tables on the woman and the women go mode one. That's mode zero. See, we don't talk enough about the fact that because of the way that the dating market is set up, there's not a lot of stigma on women having very, very high body counts. And in fact, they create narratives through the mainstream media to justify those high body counts as being a noble thing, right? So now women, when they see a man that they want, more women are more confident than ever to go approach those men. And that was what that guy was describing. He said, hey man, I don't get it. I'm being approached by all these women. Now remember, we also know that based on the articles that come out from OKCupid, and I'm going to bring up one of those studies, these women turn down more and more men every day. See, that's what's so crazy. It's like this interesting loop. It's a contradictory loop where the, the more that the average man chases after these women, the more they feel they can do better. Like, OK, if the guy that's a six in the marketplace is chasing me, well, shit, I'm going to go for a seven at least. And that's why the marriage age keeps going up, 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 and up every year. 
Last time I checked, it was like 33 for men and 31 for women. Now, here's the problem. And I've said this before. The problem with that number going up every year is that the prime marriage age in America is 25 to 35. And for every year, specifically with men, because we're the ones that, that say yes to marriage or no, every year above 35, once you get 36, 40, his chances of getting married go down. And there's a specific reason for that, because I'm going to show you a chart that proves men's wages on average continue on a sharp ascent as they age. And it peaks, I believe, around 50. So some charts show 48 to 52, right? That's about peak earnings for the American male. And then it kind of plateaus and then they hit retirement age and those guys are on a fixed income. But they still have the resources, which a capitalist system, the name capital means literally resources, assets. That's what it means. And when I show you this chart, you're going to crack up. So let me bring up this chart, man. So I'm going to kind of work backwards. I got a funny chart, man, that shows like the infidelity based on age, right? And it's not what you think. This is going to throw you off because younger men that are in marriages, they're often led to believe that they're the one cheating. No, it's not the young men. It's the older men that are cheating at the highest clip in the United States. So let me bring it up. Hey, Silent, if you want the... um. The links, I know you had a lot to say about this. Anyone that wants it, man, just let me know. It's kingsigma123 at gmail.com. I'm going to follow up on all those emails in about 15 minutes. I just want to get through a couple of these charts so we can have some context to this conversation. So uh, let me see. Let me see. So hopefully y'all can see my chart. Okay. So I keep a file whenever I see certain studies that comes out. I keep track of a lot of studies on, you know, economics, relationships, things like that. Here's one that I've had in my file for a while. This is from the um, IFS Institute of Family Studies. And it was called Who Cheats More? The Demographics of Infidelity in America. So let me read something to you. The last few months of 2017 treated us to a whirlwind of news coverage on sexual harassment and abuse with powerful men from Hollywood to Washington, D.C., falling because of sexual misconduct. It continues into the new year with Missouri Governor Eric Gritchens, the latest to fall, and most of these men are married. When Time Magazine picked the Silence Breakers as the 2017 person of the year, few people paid attention to the other group of women negatively impacted by the fallout. The spouses of the men who engaged in inappropriate or even criminal, in some cases, sexual behavior. Now, it goes on to say, in general, men are more likely than women to cheat. 20% of men and 13% of women report it, that they've had sex with someone other than their spouse while married, according to data from the recent General Social Service. So there was like a 7% gap in cheating between the men and the women. Now, why it's important to understand, look at the numbers, because we have to think about how women's sexual marketplace value changes over time and how, you know, from from from. So let's see. OK, so here's a chart. Now, look, at the gender cheating gap is wider among older adults. Percentage who reported having sex with someone other than their spouse while married. People, people in the audience, please pay attention to this important chart that I'm not sure that anyone's ever shown because I didn't know about it until I found it myself. So if you guys already knew this, this is just going to be um, a replay for you, and you can just uh, follow along. But now look at the chart. Notice. So let's say prior to 1975, the marriage cohort between 18 and 30 was much, much higher than it is in 2021. So now we see 18 to 29-year-olds that say that they've cheated on a, on a married person is at 10%. 30 to 39 is about 13% for men. So we're going to do the men's first. Men in the 40 to 49 age range, 15%. Now look at the huge jump and the huge incline from a man at 40 to 50, 49 to 59. Look at that jump. So it's the men that are 50 
50 to 70 that have the highest percentage of cheating on their spouse. And I'm going to let the panel, you know, talk about why they think that is, because I don't want to get too deep into that. I want the panelists to give me their opinions on why they think. Why is it that it's the men that are 50 to 70 peak? It peaks for men at age 70, their cheating rate. And I know at least one factor is because so. So remember, the gap between men and women in America is 7 percent as far as cheating. Right. But there's a reason for that. And I'm going to tell you, my speculation is that the only reason there's a gap is because a woman's sexual marketplace value dips tremendously after the age of 60. She doesn't have the ability to secure mates at the clip that a 60 year old man does, because look at the gap. OK, it's the men that is 50 to 70 years old that are the ones that are the biggest infidels in the United States. But we have to put an asterisk on that because the question becomes. Are those women trying to cheat that are 50 and above? Because the gap is still pretty small until you get to the age of 60. Up until the age of 60, men and women are very close. Now, notice that the cheating amongst men and women between 30 and 49 is really close. They're see, but but what happens is that at age 30, the, it's equal. So at, at age 30, it's equal for men and women, right, in America. But something happens in the United States where once a man hits 30, his likelihood of cheating begins to go up, but it stays pretty stable until he hits 40. Now that, but I'm telling this is related to resource. This is related to money and experience because those are things that women value. Right. The American woman values a man that is charismatic, charming, who has resources and he's stable. But he has, you know, because at that age, a man is people gotta understand a man's muscle maturity doesn't even mature into his mid to late 30s. He reaches his muscle maturity um, peak, probably like around 38 or something like that. That's when his muscles are considered the most mature. That's why so many bodybuilders, you'll be surprised what their age are. Most of your Mr. Olympia's. And your top 10 bodybuilders because the muscles continue to mature even though there's some somewhat of a dip in testosterone that's overstated for men that are very health conscious and then exercise three to four days a week so there's just this big jump that happens that starts to separate men from women in their 40s and i say it's because of a woman's physical deterioration is much quicker than a man's on average and so her supply of men that she's going to be able to cheat with probably shrinks at that age. They don't give the exact psychological reason. So we're all going to just speculate, but I just can tell you what the numbers say. And there's a big jump for men, 40 to 50. And, and it didn't even peak until 70. You got yourself, damn, it's the 70 year old man. Because a 70 year old man, besides the physical has probably everything that a woman would want, especially when you have a nation of fatherless women. So he has the fatherly thing going for him. Most likely this dude that we're talking about that's able to, to get out like that. He has money going for him. He has resources. He has experience. And he's probably raised adult children by that age as well. So those could be things that women find attractive. I know it shocked me. You know, I always I thought it would have been 50, but it's actually 70 years old. So men start to really pop their collar around 50. Because, again, like I said, this is when men's peak earnings in the United States and what happens once they get around 60, a lot of these do start to retire after 55, but they're on a fixed income. They have their savings. So being that America has like in the West, Americans work more than most G20 countries, American labor force and our workers work harder than and get less vacation than most other G20 countries. So based on what I'm reading, a lot of these men retire and now they're like, you know what? Hey, I abstained. I did everything right. I had the one wife. I raised kids or I didn't have the wife and the kids, but somehow I have stand. I'm ready to play now. And this is when you get like a lot of American men, at least they start to want to get that woman that they couldn't get at 25 or 35 because of many different reasons. But for some reason, they start to really, you know, pop their collar after the age of 45 or so. So let me go down the chart. But that's there. So hopefully everyone can see that. Women's drop, their infidelity drops tremendously starting at age 60. And that's that's why I want to see what the panel says. Me, I say it's because this is when they're the least desirable to men. So that's the only reason it's dropping. 
you know, but on average, there's only a 7% gap in America. So there was another chart. So let me stop. I'm going to go back to the chat real quick. There's one more um, graph that I want to look up before I bring up the panelists. So let's see. So, um, so brother said, uh, so someone said menopause, yep. And uh, Basidian says he has the reasons. So I'd like to hear that. Okay, now, so in terms of like, when we're talking about this marriage thing, I just noticed that um, people don't wanna talk about what made relations stable, like marital relations stable throughout the time that it was at its peak. I point to at least three things that I've been able to find that made relationships very stable at that time, or maybe even four. I would say the coverture that gave lots of power to a husband, chivalry, which was enforced in the culture, through the church, through the family, and through the literature of that time, and home record laws, and fault divorce, and then plan B. So if I was gonna say five things that I've seen that have been the, the um, crumbling pillars of marriage in America, those are five that, I, that go so understated in many of these conversations. So again, plan B, Roe v. Wade, Coverture laws, chivalry, home record laws, and uh, no fault divorce. Those are five things. And when you look at economics, in economics, they have the concept of the rational person. And in psychology, they talk about rewards and benefits. And human beings are very reward and, and um, punishment driven. If we have, if we see incentives to do something, and we have a desire to do it, we'll usually do it for better or worse. When something, if there's a harsh punishment for something, then we will typically stay away, even though there are those adventurous that will break the rules no matter what. But most that, when you look at the average person, average reasonable person, they're going to tend to go by what the boundaries are by the society, by the family, and by the cultural institutions that they respect. So I just, I, I don't hear that talked about enough. The fact that reason that marriage is at its peak was because the society itself put a lot of safeguards and a lot of punishments in place to stop people from veering. So it, so with that example, I want to bring up a case that speaks to um, the home record situation, right? Because that relates to what I want to talk about with the cheating. So it used to be that all states had some kind of home record laws that punished men and women that would act as concubines to married people and destroying their marriages because of the damage that it could do to a, a family, that it could do to children, that it could be due to the community at large. So the communities came together and said that you have to have sexual discipline. You can't be sleeping with married people because the consequences are too dangerous. But there's only like six or seven states that still have those home record laws. And in some states they call them um, alienation of affection laws. And they're, 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 the penalties can be very harsh in that situation. So I wanna bring up this one case I was looking at um, real quick. All right. So this is a case um, from 2018 in North Carolina, because North Carolina is one of the last six or seven states to have alienation of affection laws. And I've seen movements to get those overturned as well. So if things continue the way that they're going, I wouldn't be surprised if no states have home record laws by 2030. But we still have a few states that are trying to hold on. So in this case, a man was ordered to pay $8.8 .8 to the husband of the woman he cheated with. A North Carolina judge ordered a man to pay $8.8 .8 million for cheating with another man's wife. North Carolina is a state with so-called jilted spouses laws. Hold on one second, man. Looks like it's a helicopter out here. Um, so the North Carolina is a state with so-called jilted spouses laws, which allows people to pursue monetary damages if they've been cheated on. Keith King, who sued for the damages, said that Francisco Huizar III followed him and his wife around the country 
even after he had supposedly ended his affair with the king's wife, with King's wife. Quasar's attorney says King manipulated his wife throughout their marriage and made her work without pay. A North Carolina judge ordered San Antonio resident Francisco Wizard III to pay Keith King $8.8 million for damages related to him having an affair with King's wife. So I'm going to close it out. But I brought that up because that's an example of how states punished people for breaking up marriages. So there was a disincentive for one to, to engage or at least to engage and get caught. You see what I'm saying? So when we talk about this whole cheating thing, I'm always hearing people talking about the man that's cheating. But here's my problem with that. Again, going back from the data that we have, OK, Cupid, you have one man in an irreligious society. This society is becoming less and less religious by the day. So the 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 influence of morality is more of a secular thing now. So when we talk about cheating, this is based on what? If we're talking about practically, I'm thinking, well, women are saying that they want the man who has the resources. They want the man that has experience. And those are going to be the men that they're chasing. So again, if you got one man and he's being chased by 10 women, it's going to take a whole lot of discipline to stop that man from somehow getting involved. But what if the society punished the homewrecker? What if society stigmatized the home record, but instead all of the onus is going to be placed on the two married people in a society that has more and more single people, thirstier, thirstier than ever before, chasing after the high demand woman and the high demand man. So when the woman cheats or the man that's married cheats, that's only one part of the story. The other part is all of this growing population of single men and single women that are getting older and older single, chasing after a few desirable mates. And again, here's what I feel like is a loop. Women desire men that are desired by other women. See what I'm saying? In fact, that's one of the way they measure the men that they wanna to talk to, because women have a tendency to be more easily pressured by peer pressure than men on average. So when there's social proof that a man is a capable mate or he's highly desired by other women, other women will chase after that man. And even though there could be a whole group of other men available and chasing that woman, we're seeing from the information that's coming out, even in the mainstream, that these women are saying no. That these women have, I don't even wanna use the term suitable, because again, that's subjective to the woman. But based on the kind of criteria that I hear men in this space using, you would say that a suitable male is one that wants to be with that woman, that would be faithful to her, and that offers stability for her. But we're seeing more and more evidence coming out of, you know, the mainstream themselves talking about this uh, lack of women even wanting to get married. So with that, I saw that Obsidian wanted to come in. I just wanted to kind of open it up with a context so that we're not just having random conversations. But so I'm going to send this link to Obsidian real quick, but I want to read the headline from the U.S. News. U.S. marriage rate drops to lowest level on record in over 150 years. The U.S. marriage rate has dropped to the lowest on record since the federal government began keeping the data in 1867. That's a big deal. We haven't seen this low uh, marriage rates since 1867. And remember, in 1867, you would have had like a shortage of men because of the Civil War killed and maimed so many men. So keep in mind. The Civil War took out a lot of prime age men. So we're at, think of, it took a war for us to get to the levels that we're at in 2021. That's pretty disheartening when you think about it. Because 18, if, the, if the 1867 was the lowest, that was on the back of the Civil War. When a lot of prime age men were taken out early or they were maimed to such a point where women probably didn't want to marry them. And we're, we're in a worse situation in 2021 when we have all the comforts, all the luxuries, all the knowledge that we have, but yet, the ability for men and women to find common ground for mating and marriage seems to be a growing and growing gap. So with that, let me go ahead and send this link out. But I, that statistic was pretty crazy that it's the older men that are the biggest cheaters in America, not the younger men. It's the older men because younger men aren't getting married, so they don't they can't cheat. 
That's why with the women, so she could be a home wrecker, but she's technically not a cheater because she's not married, but she's sleeping with married men. So you have to punish that kind of behavior. If you don't punish that kind of behavior, you're not going to change the dynamic because the more money a man makes, if he gets into marriage and you have more and more home wreckers out there, his chances of cheating are going to go up, up and up because there's more opportunity to cheat. And we have a culture that's more amoral than it is moral now. That's just the way it is. So I'm sitting, I sent the link out. Um, I don't know if Edward is going to be able to come up or not, but I saw him in the chat. So if anyone else wants to come up, King Sigma one, two, three at gmail.com. And we can have this discussion. So that link was sent to you, Obsidian. Obsidian, check your email. So yeah, there's another, um, so let me see. Another study that stood out to me was one from uh, your tango. So while Obsidian gets his stuff together, I'm going to bring up this you tango and share that with you guys. Cause you gotta, you gotta take this information together. I don't know what's going on, man, but I got military helicopters flying over my building. What the hell is going on? So, uh, let me see. So this was part of like one of the largest studies ever done on online dating behavior. It was over 650,000 people on OkCupid and Tinder's platform. As many of you know, that study was removed from the internet, but there are archives of it that you can find. So here's one that, here's a uh, author that looked through some of the data of that information. Women find 80% of men unattractive, says crazy study. Women are often thought of as picky, especially where men are concerned. Some single women are known to have lists of characteristics that their ideal man must possess, like great abs, a sense of humor, a six figure income and a nice car. When a woman meets a potential mate, she has to decide which of these traits are deal breakers and which can let which she can let go. No matter how selective women might be, some have strict physical attributes from their must have list as an OK Cupid study found that women find 80 percent of men unattractive. OK Cupid looked at their users and came up with this chart. So here's the chart from OK Cupid, one of the largest studies ever done. And they were forced to remove because of the political correctness. So here was the female messaging and male attractiveness. Look at that drop. So they found out that, you know, these women felt that most men were unattractive. That's serious, man. Eight out of 10 men not being attractive. And we live in a day and age where women have access to men that they find attractive, even if a lot of it's just in their heads, but they can at least contact men. So I see that Obsidian's in, the, in here. So let me get on here. Boom. Hey, what's up, Obsidian? Hey, King, King Sigma's been a long time no here. Long time, bro. But I, I see you doing your thing, man. I see you over there causing a whole riot, you know, Edwards Anderson. What, why are you causing trouble over there, brother? Um... Well, I didn't plan on discussing this, but I mean, in a, in a nutshell, and I was just saying to, to someone in the chat room, these are very complex issues that we're talking about here. Um, it's relatively new information. And um, it, a lot of it is information regarding the mind, particularly the subconscious mind, psychology. So we have to be very careful with how we handle this information, how we parse it, what, you know, inferences we draw from it, what conclusions we draw from it. We have to be very careful about that. And, and one of the things that I'm concerned about is the reckless way in which these topics can be um, discussed 
within the black manosphere. And what I would like to do is to caution all of us to be a bit more circumspect, sober and judicious with these issues. And I, and I realize this is a very, you know, dealing with mating issues is, is going to be very contentious because let's face it, you're talking about your existence. I mean, sex is the, the engine by which we put ourselves into the future. So anything that might threaten that is, you know, it, it hits us right to the core. So, uh, you know, Dr. Jordan Peterson talked about this. It's very difficult for us to discuss these matters in a kind of, you know, dispassionate way. But I think it's very important for us to try to be, you know, more more thoughtful about this. So uh, I think one of the reasons why I'm getting so much flack is because um, there have been a number of tenants in the black manosphere that have cropped up over the past few years that ha have been more truisms than they have been scientific fact or empirical fact. And when empirical fact bears itself out, it's, um, it's, it's kind of threatening to some people. Um, for example, there is a very noisy contingent of black men in the black manosphere who argue for leaving black America for somewhere else for mates. In and of itself, that's not wrong. But they seem not to be content with just doing that themselves, just packing their bags and leaving. They seem content on wanting to convince as many other black men to do the same. And when the data and the information is brought to them, that that's not where the mainstream of black American men are. Then that's where all the, the shouting starts. And, you know, I, I don't know, man. I mean, it's just, you know, you, I'm not I'm not I'm not under under ideology. I'm under where the data goes. So if the data says this is where the majority of black men are. As far as I'm concerned, it, that's it. I mean, I, I'm not here to, you know, browbeat black men. Why you got to do that? It's, no, that's where they are. And we have to take it from there. Now, it's not. Now, that's why for me. So I'm a person that I when I when I look at a topic, I try to find multiple um, studies, multiple surveys before I tackle a topic. So when you say that that's where most of the black men are, I'm not certain if that's true, because ultimately one of the problems when you look at the 2020 census is that the marriage data can be obscured on the surface. So let's say, for example, let's say you have 10 men and only one man is married. And he says, well, he's married to a black woman. That would equal 100% of black men being married to a black woman. But here's the problem. The other 9%, the other nine men, the other 90% are not married at all. And you would have to look at how we operate every day. We live in a culture where people are getting married older and older as that age goes up for men and women, we're almost at the point now, we're, we're probably five years away from men and women actually aging out on average of the marriage rate. So it also it's also a regional thing too. So for example, in some parts of America, in some cities, and you know, blacks are concentrated in certain cities, you have a 50% dating out. In others, you have as low as maybe a 15, but there's a spectrum that has not discussed in terms of who you have most proximity to. Because remember, most men, even if they get married multiple times, they're not probably not gonna have more than four or five wives. And I do know some men that have four and five wives, they're like 80 years old, right? So 90.9% of the women that you are having sex with, that you are socializing with, and that you're exchanging um, your time with, you're not gonna marry them. So for me, that's the data that's important when you look at the 2020 census, because that marriage, number is going down. So when you look at something just as a percentage, it can throw you off until you look at the total number. I look at this total number. And what I'm saying is that the census said it itself in 2020, this is the lowest rate of marriage they've ever seen. It, well, at least in 150 years since the end of the Civil War. So what I'm saying is that what I'm seeing out here in the dating market is that most people are either they're cohabitating or they're a part of hookup culture. Most people simply are not getting married, especially under 45. They're just not getting married. So what they're having is cohabitation relationships or they're having hookups, not just short term. Some guys are in non cohabitating long term sexual relationships. I've been in one where I had a woman that I was we weren't living together. We weren't in a technical relationship, but we liked having sex with each other over multiple years. We just liked having sex. We're compatible. And there's well, a lot. Of well, that's just it. Um, 
black Americans cohabit less than anybody else. So you are right in one sense. Uh, the U.S. Census has been tracking black marital rates since 1890. And um, we are at the lowest black marital rate since then on record. So you are right in that sense. It's also true. Black Americans um, cohabit less than anybody else. So there's a very real concern that you're bringing up here. But with regard to married black men, when they do marry, they marry black women like over somewhere over 80 percent. So um, black men who are because, you know, the high value man thing is a big deal these days. Um, black men who are solid six figure earners. 80 some percent of them when they marry, marry black women. Um, NPR did a survey about seven, eight years ago. Um, in conjunction with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Harvard University's School for Public Health, where they surveyed over 1,100 black American men and women aged 18 to 49. Um, they found that 43% of the black men wanted to be in a relationship versus 25% of the black women. So we, we have multiple sources of evidence that show us that black men do want to be in relationships and or married. And uh, that's something that kind of runs, rubs up against the notion of some of the more noisy contingents in the black manosphere um, who are, you know, advocating that black men leave and so, so on and so forth. My only thing is, is that, you know, the, I mean, these people aren't making this up, you know, these different organizations, you know, universities and so forth. They're not making this stuff up. It's the United States census. They're not making this, these figures up. I mean, th this is where black men are and they have a hard time accepting. it. I'm not saying that you have to like it, but I am saying that you have to accept that's where it are. And a lot of the guys that are on the SYSBM side of things, they are actually, you know, out of the mainstream of where the majority of black men are. And that's, that's, that's to answer your question. Why is that, you know, so many, you know, guys kind of getting up in the orbit with me is because I'm, I'm just sim simply putting that fact out. Now, to go to your other point about the cheating piece, age-wise, mm -hmm. um, with men, it's very easy to explain why the big spike, and you go back to that chart, you see the spike, sharp spike throughout the 40s decade. It continues to climb, but it's not as sharp. Um, and that's very simple. You, you gave the answer yourself in your opening statement. And that was because men's earnings really take off in their 40s and pretty much goes from their 40s into their 60s. Like you said, when they hit retirement age, that's where it plateaus off and can even decline, you know, with pensions and stuff like that. But they really hit their stride in that 40s and 50s decades. And the, and the chart tracks with that. And women's number one, uh, consistent mating criteria for men are men with resources. So men who, I mean, the, the old adage by Chris Rock comes into play here. Men are only as faithful as their options. Well, we all, all of us agree. When you're a man and you have more resources, you have more options. And this chart is reflective of that fact. One of the reasons that they had laws in place like, um, you know, fault divorce, um, chivalry through the church and through the community was because they didn't want older men competing with the younger men for the most fertile women. Society had an interest in keeping the ages matched together. But as we've moved away from that since the 70s, now the, 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 the marketplace is in a situation where there's a lot of younger guys, the highest rate of 30 year old virgins that we even know of, right? So you get they're competing with the 50 year old man who can leave his wife or his wife can leave him. As we know, eight out of 10 divorces are um, started by women. We saw with Jeff Bezos, we saw recently with Bill Gates, that women left them. But they had an interest in keeping married couples in relationships so that there wouldn't be this imbalance in the, in the sexual marketplace. So what you have now. Hang on a second, King Sidney. Yeah. You said that Melinda Gates filed for divorce? Yeah, she filed for divorce, right? Uh, no, my understanding is that they made a joint statement. 
I, I don't I don't know. I'm just I'm just asking for clarity. No, my understanding was that she divorced Bill Gates because again, remember the report said that Bill Gates that there was some something with Jeffrey Epstein that she knew about and she was trying to leave him for a year. They put out a joint statement that said to keep it private, but other reports said that she left him because that she had already planned on leaving him. But they wanted to be more amicable, so they held off during COVID. And she was she she knew about the Epstein thing because Bill Gates got caught up in the Epstein um scandal. And she didn't want her name associated with that. And well, that's, that's why she wanted to leave him. So. Well, that was the, that was the, the, the argument that that yeah, you can forget that her name is ever forever going to be tied into that. But in any event, all right, fine. I just want to be clear about that because I was well, my, point, my point to bring it up to you is that societies didn't want older men competing with younger men to the degree that we have right now because there was an interest in society to get young men wed. Because is there, is there, is there any is any is there any like historical uh, data that you can cite on by because well, the reason I ask is because all the data that I've seen throughout the world holds that older, more powerful men have always had access to more attractive younger women. Always. Yeah, they've had um, access. Yeah, but, but, they've had but, but, access. Societies wanted. Um, they've always had a thing where they wanted to to keep the population of bachelors as low as possible. Because well, no, that's the population that's can be dangerous. Opinion, because we know, that, we know we know in ancient Rome, for example. Bachelors got the, the the issue with the bachelors got such that they had tried to implement bachelor taxes. Yeah, and that's probably something. And what I'm saying is that that was one of the reasons why they wanted to get them wed. So what I'm saying is that when you have a situation of basically just no fault divorce in America, anyone can walk away at any time for one, on, for any reason. You're dumping. You saw how unequal it is, right? So you're dumping men who can compete. The older men can compete with the younger men, but the older women can't compete with the younger women necessarily. So you're dumping a lot of spinsters in the marketplace and they become, if they don't get a certain amount of money from their ex-husband, they become a burden on the state, a burden on their family. Whereas that older man will typically have resources. He can go out there and compete and block that younger man from establishing a family during prime age, 25 to 35. And that can be very problematic. Again, it's an ongoing thing. We don't know the full consequences of what's gonna happen. Cause again, like I said, prime marriage age in America is 25 to 35. And we're already at where the average man is getting married at 33 and the woman 31. So well, we, means- we, know, we know in black America that we marry later than anybody else. So age of first marriage. So we're clear on this. Age, and that's problem, but that's problem. Black women, 32, black men, 35. So that's we're very all- problematic because the, 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 the first marriage, once you get to 35 for men, it go it starts to dip very quickly. And by the age of 40, a, a, a black man specifically, but men in general, once they hit 40, their likelihood of getting married ever, it, it, it drops very low. And for you know, women- you know what the number is? I don't know the exact, well, I, I got the stats in a folder somewhere, but I just know that's a big drop because I had so many windows open, but it's a well, big for drop. A black, for, a black, for a man in general, black man in particular, yeah. if he reaches 40 and he hasn't married, he has about a roughly 12% chance of marrying. Now listen to that, 12%. That's a big deal because again, the average age is going up every year. So what happens in America, w- once the average age hits, it, by 2030, it could very well hit that the average age for black men getting married is 38. So then we could just look at the number you just provided and say, what, we're talking like 6% at that point? So I'm just pointing to the fact that there's more rewards to not be married in the short term. And people are willing to chase those short term rewards more than ever because they don't have to pay the cost until later, specifically for women. But men. So what would be the cost? Uh, this is interesting. So what would be the cost of not marrying if you're a black woman in today's 21st century Black America? What would be the what would be the incentives not to marry? I'm I'm just curious. I feel that the incentive is more to marry in America, but the incentive not to marry is that you can ride the cock carousel into as much as you want. There's some men out there that are willing to lay up with older women. There's older men that are sleep with that older woman. So for some women. They would rather be on the cock carousel at 40 years old, 50 years old, than to be with a man who can offer her stability and an escape from poverty. And what happens, that's why the problem is the state, because what happens, the state comes in and says, okay, we're gonna tax those men that never even had a chance to get married. We're gonna tax the men that were already married and we're gonna take care of those spinsters. So she may not be able to have the stability that she had with her husband, because he's gonna give her more than state, but because of that social safety net, there's really no incentive for her 
to stay married in a lot of situations, as long as that safety net, safety net continues to get bigger. But I want to give the brother Black Euro a chance of sitting because he came on. And you got the mic, Black Euro. You got it. Hey, King Singler. Thanks for having mm -hmm. me up. Pleasure oh, no talking problem. To you and Obsidian. Um, you know, I was looking at those um, the statistics you or the charting that you uh, reported. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I guess it would be interesting to know. You know what? You know, if you have such a big disparity between uh, men and women, you know, to me the logical question is. Well, amongst that difference or that disparity, with whom are those men having sex? I mean, are they having sex with sugar babies or other women? And if so, what percentage of those other women they are having sex with are themselves married, which would then askew the numbers or rates or percentages of women along the, the time continuum there upward as well. So I'm, I'm always a little bit of the of any significant disparity of of cheating or infidelity because to me it's it's always a mathematical question there one second black one yeah. second let me read the super chat to the brother sick lid 100 of black men marry black women in the 1800s seem like it's getting worse to me you got a euro no I, I just saying i'm a little suspicious of the disparity because I'm, I'm always as you think through the logistics of how people actually live, you know, and if you're like myself, you're old enough to have observed human phenomena, you know, in terms of both, because, well, look, I'm old enough and have observed enough through family, friends or whatever, I'm, I'm very suspicious of this notion of, of, of black women or of black men, even older black men cheating so much more than black women. Uh, I have not seen that. I, I have seen that they, they still run pretty neck and neck, even towards the latter years. Well, it goes by age category too, black year, because remember. No, I, I, I said even towards the latter years. Oh, but I'm saying it's actually reverses for women. Here's the thing that's funny. Men cheat more at an older age and women cheat more than the men at a younger age. No, I, I, I said even towards the latter years. Well, yeah, the, you know, we have to be because I, I think if you broke that, that because I'm assuming that that statistic or that chart is includes all of yeah, includes Americans all, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and, all, yeah. and what I'm saying is, no, I'm just speaking sort of anecdotal, you know. But, but it'd be interesting know. to observe that charting strictly amongst Ado's people. I think yeah, you would yeah, have yeah, a different yeah. sort of. Well, 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 hold on, because I want to follow up with the statistic from that same chart that I didn't get to. It just says that among ever married adults ages 18 to 29, women are slightly more likely than men to be guilty of infidelity, 11% to 10%. So they're they're tied pretty much at the younger age, the men and the women. But then, again, it, there's a big gap that begins at the age of 40. But it's interesting that it's the younger men. So younger men are getting married later and then they have more, they have to face a more likelihood of the woman that they're with being that cheating on them than the older man does. So after having that one situation in today's day and age, again, because the marriage number keeps going up and getting closer to that 35 age, that means that more and more men aren't going to ever have a second marriage. Well, why, why, why would it be, why, why do we see having a second marriage as being important to begin with? I think that we that a second marriage is important for stability of children. That's about it for me. But what, what, what if you have children from your first marriage? Wouldn't you can be concerned about the stability of that? But the but do most people have children because of how the age is going up by the time they even get divorced anymore? I would, yeah. Yes, so, they do. So 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 where is the the rate? Let's say from seventy five of people that get divorced that have children in twenty twenty one. Versus those that in 1985 or something like that. that's what is that number? Because for me, everything I see out here is that people are having children much later, and the the older you have children, the less likely you have children, and the fewer amount of children you have. And then you're getting divorced much quicker. Again, here's another problem with American marriage that we just saw with Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. They hit the statistic right on the head. Six years in America right now, the average marriage lasts seven and a half years when you take all the age groups together. People under 50, it's closer to like four or five years. So 
a lot of people, they're not even gonna, because of the career types that we have out here, they may not even get a chance to have kids in this decade of people getting married because they're gonna be getting married at 33, 35, and they're in the middle of their careers. That's why we have um, a shortage of children as it is, where people having, you know, white people now only have one of our kids. And I think for blacks is too. Yeah, so, um, okay, so I want to tack back to what uh, Black Uru said. So I want, you, you seem very skeptical of this data. So l let me just do it this way. What do you think the situation in Black America is? You tell me. Well, I mean, with respect to infidelity, and I think as the chart that you have to break it down by, by age group or generation or whatever, but I, I think, and I think Sigma touched on it earlier where there, there's a fairly high number or higher percentage of men who are virgin or have, have had little to no sex at all while their female peers uh, are having much more sex because of the advent of uh, social media, the dating app, you know, the 80 20 rule, that whole yeah, thing. Yeah, but, but, but hang on a second. So you're talking about much younger people. I'm well, asking I'm, you about, I'm a, hang on. I'm asking you about, because we're talking about older Americans. You're saying that you have questions about the data that Sigma presented, King Sigma presented regarding older Americans. So we're talking about, for women, we're talking about a sharp rise starting at around 40. So for men, we're seeing a sharp rise. They both start rising sharply at around 40. For men, obviously, it's a higher incline than for women. But for both, it starts around 40. So in Black America, you tell me what's going on with Black Americans, men and women both, 40 and over with regard to marital infidelity. You tell me. 40 and over, I, I just see kind of a fuck that. I mean, I, I see older men and older women getting their thing on. In but that's what the data, that's what the data shows us. Di dialysis and the, and the Viagra and yeah. the training and, right. and all of the Sex club you know, procedures swing. and yeah. plastic surgery and yeah. you know, all of that. I mean, everyone is extending their, their hot girl or hot guy summers well into their latter years. That's what I've observed. And I, and I don't see, again, this great disparity between black men and black women. I just don't. I, I see I see older women either with with their male peers or in some cases very often younger men and they're involved in assorted other activities in uh, workplace scenarios and clandestine relationships with So you're saying you that know, you don't see you don't see more black black men. You're seeing more black women than black men forty and above cheating. That's what you're saying. No, I'm saying at that age they're Probably fairly even at that age. So at you're saying that ages, doing, it's, it's it's dead on even, forty and above. That's what I, you're saying. I, I, I would not say dead on even. What I would say is is that they're equitable. That there is no great, there is no the disparity there. There's like a, a fifty percent disparity on the chart there. I I would seriously doubt that amongst black people. And, and okay. here's the other thing. Here's the other issue too. You know, black men, the, the life expectancy of black men is only about, what, 71? And, and so many, and, and so, yeah. yeah, and so many of us, frankly, uh, at some point, start having health problems somewhere in our latter 50s. So even the ability to perform in many cases become compromised. So what you're saying is that black men, the real the real concern here is that black women are doing most of the, the lion's share of the cheating in part because black men's morbidity and uh, morbidity and you know chronic health problems that prevent them from sexually performing even that they wanted to that's what you're and, getting and the, I, I would say if you took the I, I would say if you took a 20 year old black male of today and a 20 year old black female of today and advanced them the next you know 50 years that woman would have had will have had significantly more sexual partners than that man married or single well, wouldn't that be a, a, very, a very easy fix for any man that thinks that a woman has had too many sexual partners for his for his taste? Wouldn't it be an easy fix for that? Uh, please tell. What, what would that fix be? You don't marry her. 
and that's what's believe, happening. That's, and that's what's you happening. Believe, you believe that that woman has had one too many sex partners for your for your taste. You don't marry her. And hold yeah. on, hold on. So let's stick on that. Let's stick on that because that's what I think is that's what's happening yeah. with a lot of younger men. I they're agree. Seeing, they're not. Tell, they're saying to the woman, "You can be free. You can do what you want." But I don't want to marry a woman who has a higher body count than me. So they're abstaining from marrying. That's where's, the, where's, the, where's the empirical evidence that bears that out? Well, it's, men have been interviewed about it. Saying that they where, don't where, 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 where have men been surveyed? Well, you guys keep going and let me find, let me get let me get the right chart. So Black Year, you continue. But I did want to say this before I go. Well, I, I mean, I know I, I, I don't have a marriage have, trial, Black Girl. I got a lot of this stuff in the file. And I'll bring it up. But um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't have before me any, you know. Well, just, just, just let me say this. I want to leave you with this. Well, you and Obsidian can talk about this while I go check, go find this chart. Because I want to show what they're, what younger men are saying. And I can tell you why. For me, you get so many rewards for not being married out here. But here's something I want to think about. So let's say, based on that statistic that I told you, where the married man is in higher demand by more and more women than ever, but he has access to more and more women than ever as well because of technology. So even if you say, well, one man that's married is cheating with 10 women, yeah, more men cheat because of how women's dating habits are in 2010 or 2020, whatever. But here's something that we need to think about. Women are playing the role of home record oh. than men are based on what I can see and based on what the dating statistics tell us and what women themselves say on television shows, what women say in their own music about how they feel about married men. They don't care about the wife. And we don't have any rules in place outside of those, those six states where home records are punished. So what I'm saying is that we have more home records in the dating market today. And the and the competition for a stable mate is more fierce than ever, especially when you say an attractive stable mate. And women are willing to change the rules more than ever before as well. That's why hey, poly hey, what, rules are, what rules are being changed here? Monogamy, for example. Monogamy has been something that's been upheld as a standard, but there's a lot of women, especially in the media, that are going out of their way to change the monogamy rules. They want the new standard. Give me, give me, give me an example of this change of monogamy in the media. The rise of polyamory. By who? I mean, where, who's women. talking about this rise women. of polyamory? Women. I mean, I'm saying, give me some, give me some examples. I just, I just told you that women, when, when, when surveyed with sex, there's more women than men that are open to open relationships and polyamory. It's growing every day. Yeah, I mean, you, you, well, can, well, find, yeah, you can easily you're find... Not, you're not citing any specific source. You're just telling well, me that. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, I, I was going to give you and you a chance to talk while I get the source, but I'll bring it up. That's right. easy. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I myself, I, I can't cite the author and, you know, I can't do the bibliography, but I myself have encountered numerous articles that reference to this alleged increase in polyamory or assertion of polyamory and that women are beginning progressively more aggressive with respect to requesting these kinds of relationships. And I've even observed on cable television uh, certain shows that reference to women advocating for uh, polygamous or polyamorous relationships. So I, I think it'll be very easy for Sigma to confirm the ascent of that within cult hope. All right. So I, I heard somebody in the chat room mention Tessa Thomas. I I vaguely remember that name. And I believe she's an a female love interest in the so hold, hold on hold on guys hold on guys I got one of the articles in uh, from my file that I can bring up. So this is about polyamory. Okay. And then we can uh, return to this topic. So uh, let's see. Okay. So this is from ABC News. Uh, why more women are suggesting, so here's the title, why more women are suggesting open relationships. Again, so let's see. Before a work trip a few years ago, Chloe hinted to her husband she wanted to have sex with someone else. While she didn't have a particular person in mind, it had been a fantasy of hers for a while. Far from dismissing it, her husband suggests she go for it. That didn't eventuate, but the couple officially began a non-monogamous relationship earlier this year. Now, let me get to the part where they say that is, so let me see. Okay. Um, more and more people are actively looking for alternatives to monogamy research shows. And I'll bring up that research article. And it's women. This is what I was pointing to when I said that. And it's women leading this relationship revolution. I it's just said that. Author I just and social that. researcher, um, Wednesday Martin. The more empowered women become, the more you will see women saying, I'm done with monogamy, obsidian. Yep. Changing relationships led by women. 
The story we've heard over and over, whether it's in the media or scientific studies, is that monogamy somehow comes more easily to women, says Martin. And then we're all told that for men, it's quite natural to be promiscuous to want to spread their seed and to want to basically have sex with anything that isn't nailed down. But in the past decade, research is telling us a new story about male and female sexuality. There have been at least six longitudinal studies in total tens of thousands of books in the ranges of 18 and 70, which have shown consistently that in a long-term committed exclusive relationship, women stop wanting to have sex in years one to four. Again, so after four years of marriage, many women already are starting to lead to a sexless marriage in the West. But I, I hope, it, is that enough for you to bring up the research studies? Yeah, I mean, no, no. So we got a baseline here. So let me, so let me, let me come at it like this. So several things. One, okay. It's interesting to note that the news article, the husband signed off on it. That's number one. Number two, it may have been led by the wife, but the husband joined in. In that anecdotal he consented. So he consented. He could he could have said, no, I don't want to do that. I'm out. He hold, on. Yeah. hold on up, City. Hold up, hold up. That study was referring to thousands. We're talking about just one example they used. Right. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. In the one example that was featured, the yeah. husband signed off. He could have easily said, no, I don't want to do that. True. But in the research itself, the main point is that women are the ones that are seeking polyamory. That was the point that I made to you and earlier. And can say no. I don't want to do that. Hold on, hold on. But, you, but I'm just telling you that the that's why men are saying no. You keep saying men can just say no. I'm saying that the proof and the data that we were just talking about, men men are saying no. How do we know that? Because men aren't getting married. Getting married. Getting married. That's an assumption. That's not a fact. We don't know that. Hold it, hold it. We don't know why black men in particular aren't getting married. We don't know if it's because black women want to have want to have a seven year itch. We don't know that. But we know that they're not getting married. We know that, correct? Yes, it could be okay. any, but it could be any number but of reasons. I, but hold on, but me or Black, you would never said that it was the factor. And yeah. in every article I've provided to you, Obsidian, I've shown you a factor. When I got on here, I said these are factors. You said when you started, you started with something that OK Cupid came out with. Yes. That showed that 80% of women found the most men unattractive. Yeah. Now you're saying something different. No, I'm saying something. That's, I'm saying that that's factors. I'm giving you a list of different oh, factors. Oh, that, hold, on, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just let me let me get this out. I'm giving you factors of numerous that are, I think, based on what I've read, that are contributing factors to the decreasing marriage rate in the West. That's my argument. Uh, but but that in the West is different than black. For see, my problem here is that we're not being. This is the reason why I said we this we got to handle this with very with kid gloves, man. We can't just be reckless with this. If we're talking about black people, reams of research have shown that black people have a completely different experience from the rest of the country. I mean, Ju yeah. William Julius Wilson on down has okay. demonstrated that repeatedly. Andrew Churlin, Mary Patillo, Catherine okay. Well, good. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought hold, hold up your because I'm glad he brought that up. Because he could be right about it. so now, based on the research you've read, what are the three top factors for black men and black women not getting married? Then give us that. But that's just it. Nobody has taken the time to interview black men. See, all of the research, all the sociological research on these matters, yes, have been focused on black women. Case so in what? point, case in point, Ralph Richard Banks is marriage for white people. 2011. He says in the book, he started out his research talking to black men, but he switched over to black women because they had more to say about it. Okay, so let's start with that. Since you've done that research, we'll get back to the men part because that's going to be more speculation, you said. So what were the top three reasons where black women said they're not getting married based on what you've read? Well, in the book um, is marriage for white people. We're going to use that as a kind of baseline. They made this, the case and it's, you know, the usual bromides about there's not enough men on my level. And, you know, we all heard the, the usual stuff and mm -hmm. um, and which which can be refuted now empirically. For example, mm -hmm. the idea that there's not enough educated black men. Oh, that's not true. We know that the, the numbers of educated black men and black women 
are within the margin of error. In other words, if you're a black woman and you went to college within the last quarter of a century, chances are very high you had black men on the campus with you. Now okay. they may not have, they they may not have been sexually attracted to you, but that's a different that's a different question. The the argument that black women framed it as there were just not enough eligible brothers, that's empirically not true. Empirically Okay, so what was another, uh, the another, give me uh, two more reasons that you read. Just one, I just need three. But I, I want to talk about three. So what was the next one? So you said not well, on I, the I don't have I don't have the book in front of me right now, but 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 that, that's the key argument. The key argument is that there's not enough eligible black men. And black women have been beating this to, to, in the ground for almost three decades straight. And it's, I'm sorry, the empirical evidence just doesn't hold up. It just doesn't. I think what a lot of black women don't want to say is that there are not enough guys who are sexually attractive. Now that brings us to the, That's the now, okay. now scientifically, empirically verified 80-20 rule as black women defined it. Shout out to Essence Magazine. Mm -hmm. Okay. so and I, think, and I think the reason why a lot of black women are reluctant to do that because it invites, shout out to Kevin Samuels, it invites height, weight, dress size. Mm-hmm. It invites that. You have these exacting standards for a man physically, then it's inevitable that people are going to look at you. Exactly. But that was my point. I'm saying that men have their physical standards as well. And one of the factors why men aren't marrying women, because these women don't meet their physical standard. But since you're saying that you haven't been able to find a lot of empirical data on the men, we're going to have to go anecdotal. And we're going to have to just work with the audience and the panelists. So let's take you, for example. So you he's married. So, but you, during your prime age, what were the top three factors of why you didn't marry a black woman? Well, that's easy. The women I wanted didn't want me. And the women that wanted me, I didn't want. The end. So there was uh, a new, I, uh, new well, woman let's, in, let's, in let's, your marketplace can, that you... Can, can, can we that go ahead, Jira, go ahead. Uh, how, how aggressively did you pursue opportunities you know, because this is a big world. You know, I mean, I know, I, I understand you. You live in uh, Philadelphia, but, but hold on, Euro, because I just want to—I just want to follow up on that question. I'll give it back to you because he said the women that he wanted didn't want him, and the women that wanted him, he didn't want. And what I'm saying, we need to stick on that because I suspect, based on what I've seen, so we already got that men have their own physical standards now, and the market is much more open than it's ever been, and they have a bigger selection of women to choose from. But I suspect that there are lots of black men out there that had the same experience that Obsidian had in their prime marriage age, age 25 to 35. There's a lot of black men. If you can take surveys of the men that come to these spaces and that I've talked to that said, when they were at 25 to 35, the kind of woman that they wanted, she wasn't available to them for whatever reason. So by the time he hit the non-prime marriage age now, he's not really that much interested in getting married. So I don't think your experience is all that different because think about it. Someone like you who has been pretty in a, in, a, in a city of a conscious movement like Philadelphia, what would make you think that your experience is all that um, dissimilar from other black men in urban areas when you were 25, 25? Matter of fact, one of the big books that you promote, Blame It On Rio, talks about that in there. Those were the men that your age when they were surveyed. Most of the men in that book. Many of those men were married too. Yeah, a lot, but they were also what you call high value men based on that standard as well. Yeah, so so I don't know if I would use the black men in the book overall for your argument, given the fact that quite a few of them were actually married. Yes, but a lot of them, even though they were married, were complaining about these women not meeting the standards during the course of their marriage. Why did they marry them? Because women change and men change. Easy. See this? See, hold on. We have this yeah, idea. So, so, so we're talking about different things here. But, but hold on. Because the thing yeah. is, people change. Human beings are always changing. Environments change. I agree with that. Their, their, their interests change. I agree with that. So, so the problem with human marriages is that we, we have to take fact that everything could seem perfect when you marry someone. You might, everything might be great. The sex might be great. You might be financially compatible. But there is no constant in human life like things can be one thing in year one look really good right in year two or three and then 
it could be the smallest thing that could change both of your relationships. Health, your health could change. Um, a promotion at work could change environment. It's a lot of things that can change people's minds and bodies that would make them not want to be together. Now, them now, now to, 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 your, to your point, in fairness to your point, yeah. is that um, don't blame it on Rio does talk about the obese. And I found it really interesting when I read it at the time because um, this book came out in 2008. So this predates or came along when the Black Manosphere 1.0 was operating, put it that way. And mm -hmm. what they were saying in the book, you know, like seven years before I got a hold of it, seven, eight years before I got a hold of it, was really prescient. They were talking about how a lot of black men were going to Rio because a lot of the black women here were seriously overweight. Yes. So, so yes, and some of those guys were married, some, not all. Some of the guys were married, and they, their wives had picked up over, had picked up weight. But my thing was, okay, I get that argument, but why didn't you why didn't you put your foot down on that, man? If your wife is picking up too much weight to the point where it's, it, you can't even, you don't want to have sex with her anymore, why didn't you say, listen, man, you got to lose weight, or I'm done? So, even, okay, well, I, based on what I read, a lot of the guys felt that because of children. I have an example. I have a buddy who was in a marriage, and he told me straight up that he cares for his wife and his wife cares for him. But the reason that they stayed together, because for him, it was important for him to stay with her for the children. He put his children's interests before his own selfish interests. And what happened, once his children got out the house, they got divorced eventually. But they right. stayed together. Right. Some people will stay together because of, they feel they put the interest of the children before their own interests. I so would go along with that, except the guys in the book didn't do that. They went to Brazil. Yeah. So I go along with what you're saying. You say, okay, I'm putting the children's interests up before my own sexual needs and stuff. Like, okay, I can hear that. But those guys weren't doing that. They were going to Brazil, man. And here's one of the reasons that they said too. They were they did they weren't willing to pay the cost of leaving their marriage when a one or two trips to Brazil may cost them four thousand dollars. But divorcing that wife, some of these guys were very prosperous. Because I remember one guy was a, in a white shoe law firm that was interviewed in the book, and he didn't want to leave because it could cost him more to leave her than to just keep her for now at least and uh -huh. go do what he was doing on the side. Uh -huh. that was uh -huh. that. About that. Yeah, there were some men that were doing it. I mean, I know they were doing it. I'm just saying I think that that, that reasoning is dubious. But okay, it, okay. Well, no, no, no. See, you're not getting off the hook on this one, bro. You had me read this damn book, and we're going to talk about some of the points that were made in the book. Okay, I brought up my notes from that book. Here's a guy, Jermaine, an educator from Memphis, Tennessee, said, Black women are demanding. I feel I would need two of me to make any black woman happy. I just find black women demanding to a point where it's difficult to deal with them on a 24 hour, seven day basis. What does so that got to do with the size piece though? With the side piece in Brazil? No, 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 I said, what does that have to do with black women's obesity though? I thought that's what we were talking about. Well, we're talking about factors that contribute to why black men are getting married. And these are some of the facts. Obesity is one of them. Attitude is another one that was mentioned a lot in the book. That was one of the most consistent arguments was that these women have bad attitudes and what I, and and a lot of these attitudes come later in the marriage. Like we just pointed out with the facts. Women were saying that they don't want to have sex in America at a greater rate after four years. So what happens, a lot of these men, they're satisfied at first, but a lot of the problems start developing a relationship after the one, two, three, four years. And then these traits that were not there initially begin to come out. So that's another factor that hidden traits come out as they approach the three-year mark in modern marriages. And again, like you said, this book is like 12 or 13 years old. So you said hidden traits. Yeah, because women, let's not, let's not be, let's, let's be serious. Women are very good at um, hiding certain qualities and behavioral traits when they really want something. But, wait a minute, but, I thought, but I thought the issue, well, okay, so number one, we got obesity. You ain't hiding that. Number two, yeah. attitude piece. Attitude. The guy just got finished saying that the attitude was very apparent. So, I mean, how, what is being hidden? But because this comes out later in the marriage, though, that's the point that you're overlooking. They right. didn't start the, guy, out the, the guy that you just mentioned, though, talked about how a lot of the women, you know, have these attitudes that he that he can't contend with. But hold on, that guy that he was in a marriage, that Jermaine wasn't married, he was single, and he was right. talking about why he wasn't going to get married. Exactly. So, so he's so, so it wasn't hidden in his case. But there were other cases where the men complained that once the women started to put on weight, once they had to kids. 
a different attitude developed, Obsidian. A right. different attitude developed or came out. It may have already been there, but it wasn't there. Uh, it wasn't oh, yeah. noticeable when they married the woman. It came out later. What, 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 what also what? may have happened is that the men themselves evolved as they became more accomplished, as they became more competent, more secure. They became less tolerant of the misbehave, the mistreatment of the women. As okay. you get older, I, 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 older I, 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 you, you, you get to a point, especially as a black man, you see, well, I might not have, I don't have as much time left as there is behind me. I don't want to live the rest of my life that way. Okay. So I may have put up with it, you know, when I was younger and stronger and more fit and was distracted by other things, but I don't want to check out that way. Okay. So my thinking is, so since the question that King Sigma put on the floor was to use me as a kind of, you know, benchmark for why black men are marrying, my position is, you know, I'm not going to put myself in that position to begin with. That there's not going to be a position for me to extricate myself from because I'm not going to put myself in that position to begin with. If I don't get exactly what it is that I want, I don't want nothing. Now, here's the thing. A lot of men are agreeing with you that are younger. So when you talk to men under 40, they say the same thing as what they say. Look, at these women, the, what I'm seeing up front, this isn't marriageable. So I'm just going to avoid marriage altogether. I'm going to do the casual sex thing until maybe one day I do find a woman. And what we're finding is that it, men are saying it's becoming harder and harder to find marriageable women because of what you just said. But here's the problem, though. We're not we, don't able have, to get we, don't, we don't have any we don't have any empirical sources. What we're, we're, we're going by is very anecdotal. So I'm not saying it well, not true. Well, okay, does it blackdemographic.com report that only about 30% of black men are married? What big pardon? About 30% of black men are married. Are, again, are, again are, hold on, I'm sitting, hold on, I'm sitting, because I want to go back to something I said earlier. Again, my basis argument is that people go by what they see as being a reward and punishment. Marriage itself as an institution has a bad um, record in the United States right now because of what people see. For example, you were talking about the black culture. Younger men say, okay, black women get married the latest, they have the shortest marriages and they have the highest rate of divorce. We're not, we're overlooking the fact that people don't have to experience something they learn from also observing. So if you know that to be true and you're a single man, like, damn, black women have the highest rate of divorce. They get married the latest, but they get divorced the fastest. There's a lot of men that are saying the marriage institution itself is a, is a, a product that has a lot of issues and it traps men in a situation that once you make that decision, you're trapped in that contractual relationship. And they're saying, hey, I'm, I'd rather just do the casual thing. And that's well, the here's, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I did a poll last month on my YouTube channel because I wanted to find out nobody. I looked around and nobody had done anything like this. And so I decided to do it. And uh, this was May 17th. And, um, I, and it was in, in a 24 hour period. I got almost a thousand respondents and one of the highest votes I ever got for a poll yet. And its name of the poll was called Confer Black Confirmed Bachelors. Why did you never marry? Number mm -hmm. one. Because the women I wanted didn't want me, 25%. Mm -hmm. Number two, because the women who wanted me, I didn't want, 8%. Number okay. three, because the society, culture, and family court is against me, 41%. Okay. Number four, because I wasn't successful, wealthy, or attractive enough, 10%. And number five, because black women suck overall, 16%. So the, biggest, the two biggest responses I got was because the women I wanted didn't want me at 25% and because the society, culture, and family court is against me at 41%. So that's mm -hmm. probably like the closest thing we have that I'm aware of, of an actual poll aimed at confirmed black bachelors. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I'm not surprised by that data that you just presented. I'm not surprised at all. And, I, so I, 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 I'm really, and I've been really scouring um, more academic and research-oriented um, sources and and it's amazing. I, I haven't been able to turn up anything. If anybody uh, if anybody out there can hit me up the Obsidian Files at gmail .com, I would love to see it. But you know that's what showed me to do the poll to begin with. I'm looking for data too. I, I keep a file. That's why I had those files on record. But I'm just telling you that my me looking at it and just going by my own theory, okay? Because like since there isn't a lot of empirical data, you just have to try to start 
you know, uh, making inferences based on what we can see as the conclusion. So you start with the conclusion. All I know and you know is that for everybody in America, the marriage rate is the lowest in 150 years and it's even lower for blacks. And I see you mentioned obesity. Um, a lot of black men say attitude. And now some say the law, a, a big percentage in your own survey said um, the law. And again, the home record laws were part of that. No fault divorce was part of that. So men see a situation where they see more disincentives for marriage than incentives is what I'm saying to you. Because again, it's human nature to run towards what is most pleasurable and the easier role. So when people see, well, this is gonna be pleasurable, they tend to wanna take that route. So if marriage was really, really just like so awesome, being one of the oldest institutions, people would be running into it. So for whatever reasons, and again, there's no um, ultimate conclusion that we can come to yet, men are choosing not to get married. And those factors that we've listed are contributing to it is what I'm saying. Well, I mean, for example, we have another factor in the mix here with regard to young men, let's say. So we're yeah. talking about under 30. Well, a big problem for them is the economy. I mean, they have they have a very, you know, um, tenuous place in what's called the gig economy and so forth. So that's a major factor for why, you know, they're they're not getting married. So so that wasn't a factor for me at all. Economy wasn't it wasn't an issue. And, you know, attitude wasn't an issue for me. You know, all, the, the main issue was very simple. The women I wanted didn't want me and the women that wanted me, I didn't want the end. And you said that was in your poll was like only 8% that agreed with you on that, that had that similar experience? The, the, the question of the women that wanted me, I didn't want? Yeah. That's 8%. That came in at number two, 8%. Okay. Yeah, and the economy the economy part is important because, again, you already have the legal aspect to do it, but life is more expensive than ever before. And as we know, in 2021, inflation is the highest it's been in like 20 years in 2021. So the inflation is going up, wages are stagnant, and marriage is expensive, especially if you're a man that's, because again, most men that are trying to get married, they're trying to um, do something that is different than what we've been seeing. Like you wanna be in a relationship that's stable. You want your woman to be there to raise the children with the kind of learning that you would want them to have. So that's gonna take money. That's gonna take stability. And it's so it's every year as that inflation goes up, and the wages stay stagnant or regress in certain sectors, it makes it harder to establish a relationship as well. Because again, when you take on a woman, even if you're talking about entry level middle, middle class, you're talking about 45K per person for an adult. So that's gonna take like 90K if you don't want your woman to stay at home at least. And a lot of men, if, you, if, if you're gonna have a situation where she's there to raise the children, she's probably not gonna be able to work, at least not full time. And you're gonna be able to have to carry that extra burden with each kid. If we're talking middle class, we're talking in 2021, about 15,000 per year, just to be entry level middle class in modern United States. So marriage is very damn expensive in 2021. And it's easier for a woman to see, think about it. So it's more expensive than ever, but at the same time, it's easier for a woman to leave. And this man has made lots of investments. So that's a problem too, because the more, if you're gonna get married, you're making a big ass investment as a man and you want a great return on that investment. So that's, I think that's a factor. So what kind of return on investment are you looking at? If you are married? Yes. To me, the return on investment for marriage is having someone to raise your children with your vision and to be someone that supports you in your economic endeavors. To me, that's outside of that. What is the purpose of getting married in 2021? All right. So that then raised the question, that then begs the question, were you selecting for that when you got married to begin with? And that is the question. I can't answer it because I haven't decided to get married yet. But, but for the men that, that, that get divorced, I think that's a very, very fair question to ask. Were you selecting for that in the first place? Black Yuru, you're married. Where do you fall on this uh, spectrum? Well, you know, I, I mean, look, short of being Professor X Obsidian, you cannot possibly know whether or not you, you can do all the quality control, due diligence, whatever. I mean, any day of the week, there are thousands of men in divorce court somewhere. I don't believe that most or all of those men did not do some sort of reasonable assessment of the quality of the women when they asked them to marry them. I think that very often those men were betrayed, misled, lied to. Now, maybe the thing to learn going forward is, you know, in the advent of various sort of information systems and computing systems and investigation services, you know, perhaps
perhaps a man should take a much more formal approach to vetting a woman than they were historically trained to do so. You know, nobody tells you, for example, that, you know, maybe you should run a, have a forensic accountant uh, analyze your, your uh, intended financial situation or do some sort of private investigation assessment of her behavior or her social media history. You know, nobody really trains you to do those things. But I, if I had a son, uh, an adult son, those are things that I would definitely recommend to him. Now, that would those are not necessarily things that I think most are necessarily trained to do. But simply, you know, just sort of doing some sort of telepathy on a woman and what she says, what she does, you know, it takes a lot more than that. And again, I think it was Sigma himself said, you know, women will change up on you. You know, they, they will, for their own biological reasons or circumstances, or they get some some special interest all of a sudden from some old boyfriend or, you know, whatever. So I, I'm, I'm more empathetic to men in that regard because I don't think the majority of men make bad choices. I think the choices they make change on them. Hmm. Well, um, you, you brought up a good point because I had asked this on another panel a couple weeks back that, man, I know women that are in relationships now that are married because of the technology. They will contact you by DM just to say hello, you know, and they're keeping you up to date and they'll send you pictures. I think one of the things that's underestimated is that the technology has made everything so much closer and the ability to be promiscuous and have affairs is easier than ever. And I was even asking the panel the question, like, in your experience, do you feel like women today are ever off the market? Because, again, I follow a lot of women and based on what I, I, they give me access to and what I see them giving the public access to, it seems that the modern woman is always on the market, man. So are the modern men. Yeah, that's again. So that's one of the problems with marriage as well. Okay, but, but here's the difference. Well, what's your problem but is? Well, but here's the difference, Obsidian. Who initiates most of the divorce? Well, well, we know that women do. Right. So the men may be, quote, on the market. Maybe they're on the market for sex. Maybe they're on the market for sex. But they're not on the market to blow up their marriages. They're not on the market to force their, their spouse to have to sell their home and divvy up their 401k and take their children away from them, whatever. That's the fundamental difference. They may both be on the market, but the results of what they're on the market for very often a very different thing. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like what the issue sounds like what the problem here, and I've talked about this before, and it's it's, it's and I talked about this in my book too, uh, which you should check out, Kingston, when you like it. I got uh, it on my list. I got the uh, right now. I'm doing a lot of tech books right now, but I got your book on my list. Yeah. Um, the real problem that black folks are having along these lines is modernity and freedom. Um, and I'll just get right to it. Black women are free. They're free to do whatever they want to do. Now, is it is that freedom, you know, with no consequence, freedom at no cost, freedom without any responsibility? No, it is not. That That's where the conversation has to inevitably go. But as far as, you know, um, because it, this, this, this is something that has to be honestly dealt with. There's a really good book. You can add this to your list, uh, King Sigma. Mm -hmm. um, David Buss got a new book out called When Men Behave Badly. You love it. Um, he gives the scientific evidence for the 80-20 rule. So that, that, that matter has been settled. But it's not a matter of debate anymore. It's not a manosphere truism somewhere hidden on a Reddit somewhere. It's, it's a scientific fact that women in a free society will mm -hmm. naturally gravitate to the 20, to the 20% most attractive men, financially, economically, physically, whatever. Yes. Okay. So that does raise some interesting questions. And one of the big questions has to be, well, what about the, the remaining 80% guys? I was just talking about this online earlier today, and I'm waiting for some responses. Mm -hmm. So if we all agree, we'll use black America. So if we all agree that the black women are all kind of gunning for 20% of the guys, let's say. Mm -hmm. Now, we know the math says that that can't work. Even if 
a portion of those black women wind up being mistresses, concubines, whatever word you want to use, part of a harem, whatever. Okay. It still doesn't work. All of them can't be that. Some of them are going to have to have to settle for the other 80%. Here's the problem. The other 80% know the jig is up. How many guys in the 21st century world want to be settled for? And, and what are they getting out of the deal? That's what I'm asking you. What are they Actually, I think that latter question is more relevant than the first question. Because the reality is this. I don't really care if you settle for me. All I really care about is you do a decent enough acting job pretending to love me and doing what I need for you to do in terms of me accomplishing my life mission. I'm fine with that. And guess what? That has been probably all of human history. Do you think the majority of men of the past thought that they were the cat's meow of every man, every uh, woman that they married? No. Very often people, quote, settle because of circumstances or because that's of just it. social you status know. or economics. People often, women always settle for men but you who just weren't necessarily the most glamorous and beautiful. But you just hit the nail on the head. The past. We're no longer in the past. And you use another well, word that was very powerful. Love. Well, <laughs> I, said, I said I don't care if they love. I hang said on. I only care if they're good at pretending. Hang on. But nevertheless, even the act of it, even if insincere, was still important. Indeed. So we are in a new period where black women are free. And freedom and freedom ain't free. Somebody got to pay. There are going to be black men who are going to pay for black women's freedom. My position is, can we acknowledge that? Well, we have acknowledged it because we've talked about the fact that the taxes, they are, they're increasing taxes to make the public pay for that. Because again, that, women, that's not just not what I mean, though. What? It's not just a financial issue, although that's part of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the Me Too piece, for example. So all of this enormous churn about a small, there's 20% of men. The men that are causing the problems ain't the eighty percent guy. Ain't the eighty percent guy in the mail room. Mm -hmm. They're the CEOs. They're the executives. But who's going to pay bear the brunt? I mean, to be fair, those guys. A lot of those guys, you know, they lost jobs. At least a few of them went to jail. We got that. But the day to day grunt is going to bear the, the day to day burden of a post Me Too world. Yes. Okay. What I'm saying is that. Part of the conversation has to be a public acknowledgement. Women need to admit that. That there are guys who are paying for you to be free. Why do they need to admit well, that? Yeah, I'm wondering, like, what, what do you mean they have to admit They don't have to admit it. Well, well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked that. So we just came from out of a Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. A time where we recognize those who paid the ultimate price for us to be free as Americans. Yeah. Right? This has been a kind of, I mean, we, we use the term a lot in the black man's sphere, gender war. And in a very real sense, you know, Me Too was a major battle in the gen, in the battle of the sexes or the, or the, excuse me, or the gender war. I personally believe that, um, I personally believe that, you know, female mate choice will be codified more in law worldwide than it currently is. But the problem for me is are we willing to acknowledge the cost, the price to bring that about? And what is that price in your opinion? Yeah. Well, can you define what you mean by codified? Codified in what way? Because before you say that, Obsidian, let me just say this. Um, Because I think what you have with modern men, there's more options away from the woman, the modern woman, than they've ever had. So a lot of guys... You know, some get into the porn thing. Some are getting into transactional sex. You notice that a lot of states are starting to decriminalize sex. There's even politicians arguing for full legalization of the prostitution trades. Um, they have uh, sex dolls that guys are buying out here. Um, some guys are traveling. And then there's also a group that not really talked about guys that are just abstaining from all of that. They're just saying they're out. So I think those numbers are growing in this time frame that we're referring to, like, you know, the last 30 years as well. 
I, I I'm reluctant to go into the uh, minutia with the um, with all the different things you mentioned because I I'm not I'm not conversant enough to discuss it to to the degree that I would like to. So I would I would rather defer from that. But what I would say and is, is to respond at least in part to Black Uru who asked the question. What, what was your question again? I want to make question, sure. You you say female mate choice being yes. codified. Can you yes. provide some detail as to what how that would manifest or yes. how you propose that would manifest? Yes. David Buss in his book argues toward the end that sex harassment on the job and sexual assault and so forth um, is a problem worldwide and that it should be something that's included in the UN Charter of Human Rights. My personal opinion, not a fact, not based on any empirical evidence, just my purely my personal opinion. I do believe that there that something like that is likely to happen between now and mid-century. I don't know exactly what form it will take, but I will tell you now, we have a version of that right now, and it's called Roe v. Wade. We have a, a, a version of it that recognizes women, in this case, black women. And this is very important because black women have gotten more abortions than anyone else. That's a fact. Yeah. Um, we recognize black women's right to determine when and under work circumstances they're going to have a baby. That has minimal to no input from the putative dad. Yes. So we so we already have that. We're already there in some respects. And that's one well, reason why I said it's likely to happen be, precisely because we already have a form of it right now. My risk, my argument is we're not looking, in my opinion, we're not looking at the full chessboard of things that are likely to happen. Like King Sigma talks about the various things that have been proposed, other things that are kind of in motion. And at the end of it, he says, there's a number of guys who just essentially will drop out. See, that's what I'm concerned about. Well, let, let me let's, let's well, project I want, to go, I, want to, I want to go back to something. I want to go back to something when we were talking about this marriage thing, because one of the things they talked about in, that, in Don't Blame It on Rio was the question that he was proposing that he came to the study with was, are black women necessary? And that was his goal is to see what these men that were saying that in 2018 or 2008 were what they thought about it. And they basically came to the conclusion that they weren't necessary. He, the author, he thinks they are, but more and more men he was seeing that at that time, I think that the average age interview um, was 45. So they would all be in like their mid fifties now or something like that. And then another thing that stood out about the book, there's a sociologist who has um, studied black marriage, but he, again, he studied it more from the women's aspect. And he said that based on his research, that with other general research about marriage in America, black married women were the most unhappy in a state of marriage. And that stood out to me because single black women, single black men, married black men were happier um, than married black women. And what I'm saying to you is that more and more younger men have access to this information. So it's like a consumer report, right? So anything that you're gonna invest in, you wanna do your due diligence in terms of knowing the front end cost, the maintenance cost, and the back end cost on anything you purchase. And I think that more and more men have read the consumer reports from sociologists like the one highlighted in that book. And they're just saying, I see more reasons not to get married than to actually get married because they figure that the risk is more than the benefit. The cost is greater than the benefit from what they've seen in their own experience, lived experience, and also what the data itself shows. Again, that sociologist pointed out that the least happiest person of all those in the dating place in Black America were the married Black women. Now, who, who, is this, who is this sociologist you're talking about now? I forgot the guy's name in, uh, that he referred to. I was looking for the actual um, report, but the author has it in the book. It's, it's in the bibliography, but he talks about it when he talks about- um, the Bibliography to what book now? Um, in the work cited in the Blame It on Rio, it's in there. Oh, the okay. Right, okay, great. Yeah, so the work cited, check the work cited, but you right. mentioned that in the, in the book because I was like, wow, okay. So, well, so well, with, with, with that being said, well, okay, so let's, yeah. let's do that again. I think it's a function of freedom. A lot hold of on, hold, on, hold on, bro. Let me let me read this. Um, yeah, the rubber band man says, Tell the old man that men are leaving and hitting abroad. This is price plus me too has hurt women because no man wants to meet with them alone again. 
And I have seen evidence come out of Wall Street that men, women are having a hard time now because a yeah. lot of men won't meet with them in private. So that, that yeah, is a role. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. that, that is one of the costs of Me Too. And I think that's something that women have to be, have to cognitively, have to consciously recognize that, yes, we can fix the problems of sexual, you know, assault and workplace harassment and so forth, but it will come at a price. And that and that's part of the cost that that the brother rubber man just mentioned. With regard to brothers leaving the country, I, I haven't seen any ev evidence that is even statistically significant. So that's not to say that it doesn't happen. But See, I, uh, when you say when you say significant, I mean it depends because a small small groups, especially if it's a small group here with a lot of resources, if they begin that trend, because again, it was your generation men that are your age that really kicked off the trend and I, and it's been growing. And I, and, and the question becomes growing at what rate? For growing from what to what? I mean, I think right now they said that black men is around 5% with passports. So it's still small. It's small, but again, we have to define the, the point. That's the tipping point. It could be only, maybe the tipping point is only 10% where it becomes. That's, where generally, it that's, that's, generally, that's generally the definition of a tipping point is around 10%. So, so that's what I'm saying. We know that as of today, before COVID, it was about 6%. Black women was like at 10, 11% passports and black men was around 6%. And what I'm saying to you is that this technology is speeding things up. Remember, every year new apps come online that are that connect you with the world. And again, one of the things that came out of COVID, more people are going to be able to work remotely than ever before because of how businesses changed their business model during COVID and found that they could save money by bringing on more 1099 remote workers. So we don't know yet what that number is going to be by 2030. And what I'm saying is that even though it's still a small number, what happens when that number hits 10 percent for black men that have passed? Because again, that's just the that's the more extreme option. But what about black men that are just going elsewhere within the domestic uh, marketplace where they're saying, hey, I can go date someone that meets my qualities of a different ethnic group? Well, 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 what, well what, is, what are the current numbers? Now, that one is really hard to pin down. That one is the hardest one to pin down because, again, we can only go by the marriage rates, which is starting to creep up to 20 percent. But again, that number isn't that that number has to be compared to the fact that marriage is going down itself. So the question becomes, what percentage of black men are dating less and less of American black women? And that is the hard number to pin down. Been trying to. It's hard number to pin down. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? You know, while we kind of go round and round on this, isn't it fast? But one of the things that's really fascinating me about this over the years, why are black researchers and academics studying this? That's a good question, man. I think it's one of those things where um, it makes them uncomfortable. It, it, it seems to me that even in this space, is kind of because see that. women okay. dominate the social sciences. And I don't think it's just women, like no. Women. Let me finish because women dominate the social sciences. Certain kinds of of store of 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 truths they do not necessarily want to be told. That's why you'll have brilliant men like uh, Dr. Tia San Johnson, Tommy Curry, or whatever. That's why they've come to this environment. Certain kinds of things you can't even study. You can't even get. You got to get financial support for these kinds of things. Well, when these things tell a particular story or a particular tale, and it's not necessarily complementary of some particular feminist or gynocratic agenda, it's going to be very difficult to get that done. Yeah, and it doesn't go with the you, narrative. You think these questions have not, you think we're the only ones who've asked these questions? You think in brilliant, intelligent, PhD black men have not asked these questions? Of course they have. Can they get the support to do the research? That's a different story. Yeah. I mean, even someone like a Jordan Peterson or someone like Doc, they've talked about their experiences in academia. I'm it, it's, it's a culture where- That's a factor. So that's a factor in the mix. Yeah, jo Jordan Peterson, I know he was talking about how like there's um, an anti-male culture um, at his university where they were trying to control speech. And that's how he became famous by speaking out against that because the majority were trying to suppress um, honest speech about um, the gender dynamics and this quote unquote gender, but really just the dynamics of men and women in the West. And he took a lot of flack for that by indirectly, he became famous because of it, but academia has a lot of built-in misandry right now. 
a city, a city president attempted to create a program to help black boys and they shot it down. And they shot it down rather quickly and easily. You know, I mean, if you think that the details particularly that represent the interests of black men in particular are gonna be fought for and told and honored and supported in, in the current American academe, <laughs> you're sadly mistaken. There is no support for this in the current academic environment. Just isn't. I think that um, it's interesting that um, Peterson could do what he does in Canada, and then you got Warren Farrell, Christina Hoff, Summers, and others here in the states. But there is no kind of we don't have that a, a black analog in Black America. That's that's really interesting to me. We we just don't have that. Yeah. And why do you think that is? I think part of it is what Black Uru said. It, it's undeniable. I've, I've talked with uh, um, Professor Tia San Johnson and Professor Ronald Neal about this. So that 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 they can't you can't deny that there's that element of it. I, I've also talked to uh, Professor Glenn Lowry. So there is that part of it. But I think it's an attitudinal thing too. I think these are questions that, like I said at the top of our conversation, um, they're very. Uh, let me let me put it this way. So Silent Lamont in the chat room is he's, I'm paraphrasing him. He say we all know what these questions will lead to. We all kind of have an intuitive sense of where it might lead. And it would be very uncomfortable to deal with those truths once they become confirmed. It's not just uncomfortable, Obsidian. You have people who hold careers. You have institutions. You have charitable organizations. You have not-for-profits, all based on a certain set of narratives, particularly about Black people and especially about black women. If you introduce into academia notions that go countercurrent to what, what has been used, for example, to encourage uh, Goldman Sachs to invest $10 billion in black women, if you create some, some actual real empirical evidence that goes against that, you're, you're breaking down the edifice that involves billions of dollars and, and thousands of people who hold careers, whole oh. industries, whole financing, etc., is predicated on these things. Well, you so know another not, thing. Oh. You In know another thing. Of, when we talk about the academic part, Black Hero, is that going back to blaming on Rio, that's something that stood out in my notes um, that was mentioned when he said that um, African American men who were married were more likely to have traveled overseas than either African American men who were never married or black men who were legally separated, widowed, or divorced. That was interesting to me, that it was the married men that were the ones that were trying to get away from their black female spouses at the highest rate. Even men that had been uh, divorced didn't need to travel to meet whatever needs they met. So I, I, that has to be investigated too. Like, Why is it that the single black man and the divorced black man were less likely to wanna um, escape so it seems to me that there's something about black men just don't want to be married to black women on average. A lot of men, they don't want to be married to them because again, it's those married black men that are the ones trying to get away from her. And it's that married black woman that is the least happiest of all the black dating categories in America. Single black women are happier than married black women. Well, you know, but there's but something very interesting about don't blame it on Rio that we have to keep in mind. Uh, King Sigmund, it just came to mind as you were speaking. You're right in what you're talking about, but don't blame it on real focuses on very successful black people. So we're talking about at least solidly middle class to upper middle class black. Yes. yes. And what that means is freedom again. You're talking about black men and black women who are economically successful and more economic uh, uh, resources mean more options. My argument is that racism has been such a major concern for black people over the past century, okay? So taking it back to, you know, the early 1900s, right? So so racism has been such a concern. You know, you look at the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, an intellectual giant, you know, 
And his argument was that everything had to be subordinate to us dealing with. And he was right. I mean, the problem of the 20th century was the, was the color line. He wasn't wrong about that. But what happened was we never prepared for the day when that would no longer be true. And what we found is that once the racial issue was no longer as, as big a force in our life, that there were other things. We, we, we had different ideas of what a good life looks like. Women, women and men in black America have different ideas because we have di we want different things. Yes. Well, I, I think uh, it's a little more complex than that, because I think black men want black women more than black women want black. Men. I agree with that. Well, that was proven. That's been proven. Well, 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 one so thing, so, one, so it's one thing to say we want different things. That's a very different thing, different thing than saying I want you, but you don't want me. Well, that's, that, well, well, we, well, we're kind of parsing it out, but but I, I get where you're going with this, and I think that you're right. That black men want more, but want black women in a traditional way than the other way around. Black women want black men in a more modern context, where they want to be a partner, where they want to be able to have equal say in what goes on and what shocks are called. Who they, leads? They don't even want partners. They don't want you. They not over the long term. They want whatever kind well, of that's just, well, that's just, well, that's or just reproductive. It. Or not. Well, what I'm it. saying is, they, look, they want you for convenience on a temporary well, that's, basis. That's, that's what I'm talking about. In a modern context, black men want black women in a traditional context. Black women want black men in a modern context. So here again, we're back to they want different things. And the thing is, if they want different things, they have the ability to explore finding those different things easier today than ever before. And that's right. something I was telling you when and you that, had, when you had, that, when, you had your thesis, yeah. when you had your thesis that the problem of the 21st century in Black America was that Black men and Black women don't get along. And I told you in conversation before that I would add to that and say they no longer have to. And that's why I read and blame don't blame it. He asked that question: Are Black women necessary? You should have said, are black women necessary to black men fulfilling lives? And the question has been answered since that book was written that more and more black, a growing minority of men are saying, no, they're not necessary to the fulfillment of my happiness, but they're sufficient. And that's important. It's important that you, you say they're not necessary, but it's sufficient. Meaning if a black man can get that black woman that is on the same page with him, he'll take her. But more and more black men are saying, no, she's not necessary. I can go find another female that meets my needs. And I think that's an important piece as we go through 2020, because, again, the demographics of America are changing quickly. The 2020 census data showed that Asian Americans are pushing 8 percent now. Their population alone doubled from 2000 to 2020 from a little bit under 4 percent to now almost 8 percent. And they're predicted to surpass the black American population between 2030 and 2035. The biracial population is growing. The Latino population surpassed blacks, I believe, in 2018. So people are having access to more options of dating than they ever before. And it's only going to keep growing. So I but think that's, that's, just it. But that's just it. So what are the most successful black men doing? It depends on which one I'm talking about. Let's, okay, I'll give you an example. The most successful one I'm talking about. Let's look at the NBA because entertainment, you know, is huge among black people. Many, a high percentage of black entertainers, especially under 45, let's say, have non ADOS mates, and it's growing. Not true. The majority of NBA uh, uh, basketball players have black wives. I said a lot of them that are coming into the NBA now, because when you look at the NBA drafts, the last so NFL. What, draft, what, what number? So, what number and cohort are we looking at? Man, I would say based on, because I'm talking about the younger guys. Again, we're talking about the guys that, let's say, under 28. When you look at the NFL draft, the NBA draft, we're talking like half of them have non ADOS women, for real. And I could do a whole upload for like two hours. We have to, we would have to scour through the the, the, the draft picks, and I mean, the, the, we, we know that, we know that we know that all of the major movers and shakers of the NBA right now, LeBron, Steph, they all got black wives. We can but say the same thing. Yeah, for but those, those, those are all, those are all older guys. 
I, but I'll go, I'll go you one step further. Well, hold on, you're, you're, hold on, you're, because I want to say, here's another thing. Again, we got to go by that percentage thing. So you might say the movers and shakers have wives, but then it's like the women that the majority of these guys with, that, that are because they're most of them are not married, who are they dating? Like Paul George, for example, he just got married. And I think he got married to like a Latina. Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard. He just had one of the greatest game sixes in NBA history. I, 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 asked, I asked the question, what are the most successful black men doing? They're marrying black women. No, they're not. Not It's a mixture. It's a mixture in the NBA. It's a mixture. Oh, boy. It's a mixture, bro. Are, are we just talking about the NBA? No, oh, he brought oh, the NBA. I didn't bring the NBA. NBA. I just, I just I said, I said, I said, what are the most successful well, black men? I, 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 I think you men. all are a generation behind. The mixture. Successful, a black mixture. Men, successful black men defined by income. Uh, so uh, we know that 85% of black men making 100 grand or more are married to black women. We know that. Now, what's the source of that? that and that 15, but here's the question. That 15, that, that, that number is getting closer to 20% that are marrying out. The question becomes, are these the poorer black men, the middle income black men, or wealthier black men that are married no, no, out? I said, I said the, 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 the most successful black men in America, 80, some 85% of them are married to black women. And again, are we talking under 40, over 40? You, you mentioned LeBron James. Yeah, so, hold on, you got to help. I, go ahead, you go ahead. Because I'm just saying, LeBron LeBron James, James. that's the same Bron LeBron James. LeBron James Jr. is doing TikTok videos with little blonde white girl. If you look right. at the he's NBA, not, not, if but, you look at the NBA, the, the current bro. stars coming in the NBA, you will know yeah, that. But, but then that's different they're cut they're, they're they're taking over the nba we're talking, we're talking about projections well i'm talking about what no, I'm talking, I'm talking about if you look at the nba many of the stars of the nba coming into the nba as well as the nfl they aren't even black they're mixed mahomes is mixed. Uh, you know all i mean look at these guys in fact a lot of the guys who are coming into the nba and the nfl the star the young stars are the sons of black athletes with white and Latino women and even Asian women. Look at them. Notice how light-skinned did so many of the young uh, players are, particularly in the NBA. It's startling. So, yeah, you were in, a sta in a static sense, uh, uh, Obsidian, you may be correct. If we looked at what's going on right in this very moment, you're probably right. Will that be the case five or 10, 15, 20 years from now? I seriously doubt. Seriously doubt. See, I thought that Steph Curry's wife was biracial, though. They're both. I think Steph's mom is, is mixed, and I think her, one of her parents, they're, you know, they're yeah. mixed up. There. If anybody remembers, wasn't Ice, I, I always heard that Ice, Ice Curry was biracial. I think her father was biracial. And again, you yeah. know, that thing changes every day because even looking at the census, you have some biracials that say I'm biracial. That was three percent, but you have a lot of biracials who say that they're black. So there's still some. A lot of biracials still call themselves black, but others call themselves biracial, and a few call themselves white. So, the, so what I'm saying is that that number is growing of black men that are taking that are saying I have these options available and I'm going to take them. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I think the older and and typically the the most successful people. Uh, men are older and and because yes. they come from you know either boomers or gen x where there was more segregation racially in terms of dating yeah m many if not most of them do have black mates but they are a product of a very different environment and a very different mating calculus than that of their son and like i say i i don't think it's it's i think it's very interesting you mentioned lebron james and I'm seeing, you know, YouTube and TikTok videos with him and his son and these little white girls. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so I don't I know. Have, I, have, I, have, I have the actual uh, information here for you. So, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, send it to me in the private chat so I could uh, look yeah. it Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to uh, give you the, the link right now. And uh, so you'll be able to. Uh, but I think what the true, you know what the true test is going to be? The true test is going to be when the millennials turn 50 and 2030 because again that being peak earnings this decade is going to be very telling 
because a lot of the data that we're talking about is so many unknowns. And by 2030, we're going to know because, again, the millennials turn 50 in 2030. And then you have the, the Z's. They'll be 40 that year. So we'll know then. But I'm just saying that all I'm saying is that the number is growing. And I see it. And I think that based on what region of the country you're in or what state, there's disproportionate numbers. So I know in my city, like it's almost guaranteed that half the black men are dating out and about a quarter of the black women are. So that's what you see, because again- You're in, you're in Minneapolis? Yeah, I'm in the Twin Cities. And um, that's all you see. Uh, and I see bro, even, that's all you, I, I spent quite a bit of time in-, in Yeah, the, Twin the black women like, complain I, about it. I almost never see black men with, with sisters. <laughs> bro, bro, that's what I be trying to tell people. I be trying to tell people that they don't get it because in my city, like, I mostly only date brown skinned black women from the diaspora. That's what I like, right? Mm -hmm. And even today when I'm out with like one of my black girlfriends, there are other brothers that will compliment me or black women that will compliment me just because they're so shocked. Yeah. You see a younger black man with a younger good looking black woman, it's so rare. But again, the brother Obsidian, for example, is in Philadelphia. So it's probably a whole different dynamic there. Yeah, it's more a chocolate city. Yeah, but then when I talk to brothers in like uh, San Francisco or Denver, they tell me they seeing the same things that I see out here. And then I talk to brothers in Dallas, that shocked me, because I was hearing not from just the brothers in this space, but I know a female that I'm cool with. She went down to Dallas and she's from out here, and she told me the thing that shocked her. She said she had never seen that many black men driving Porsches and dating white women and Latinas, and that was in the South. She told me that a year and a half ago or so. So what I'm just saying is that this population is growing, but it's hard to get the data points on it because we still using old metrics based on just marriage. We would have to start looking at the fact that most people are cohabitating or they're in long-term sexual or short-term sexual relationships. And that, that data is hard to come by. But let me check your, uh, your link, man. You got it, Yuru and uh, Obsidian. Well, I think the increase, one data point, and I don't know how uh, available the information is, but, but one data point that you can use at least as a corollary would be the trending of the numbers and percentages and increases of uh, births identified as mixed. That would definitely tell you. The trending of that would definitely give you an indication of mating patterns of, uh, of people and, and, and the direction or divergence. And I don't know how specific they'll get with the mix, with the description Will they get to the point where they not only identify children as being mixed, but will, will they identify them as being mixed African American and Asian or African? You know, I, I mean, I don't know how how much of that sort of information will be uh, gathered, but but certainly if it is, you know, then that that could further help to distinguish the trends in which things are going. Because I think the trends are going to be there's going to be a whole lot more brothers getting with Latinos. I see it in my own family. I see it amongst uh, amongst the, the sons of friends of mine. Uh, I, I see a whole lot of mixing between black guys and younger black guys and Latina women. And you got to also look at the story of the second marriages, because like one of the brothers mentioned in the chat, Michael Jordan, for example, he's a brother yeah. who I believe is what fifty five or something like that. Yeah, he's he's 60 now. 60. Yeah, he probably like sixty. His first marriage was to a black woman. But his yeah. second marriage was to a younger Latina woman. And they that have children. Was, that was a shotgun. That was a shotgun wedding. By yeah, the way. he got twins by the Latina. Now, I looked at, thanks for the data, bro. Um, so, yeah, that's about, I, I, it, it makes sense that 17% of black men making over 100K are with non black women, and 83% of black men that are making over 100K are with black women. But again, here's the problem that 100K mark, you have to look at ages. Since older men are making more, they're in that average number as well. So it, see, I, I got to see the, the information that shows what the men under 40 are doing. What the men right, so, so, at what point, so at what point do, 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 do you start making that kind of money? You make that money in your older years. Right. Typically, uh, yeah. Exactly. That, but I'm saying we, we don't know what who these younger men are going to marry. We don't know who. The, That's the, it. We're, 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 making, we're making projections. I'm talking about. See, empirical evidence doesn't work that way. Empirical evidence works on what you can actually verify right now. Yes, and I agree. Hey, I'm not making an argument. I'm telling you that right now, you're right. When you look at the marriage right now, it's 17% of black men are dating non-black women. But what I said to you, I never disagree with you on that. I said it's growing. 
so, 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 so a, a major factor here has to be this. Could it be that what we're looking at here with the discontent with a lot of black men in, in, in our environs, could it be a at least in part economic? I think economics is a factor. I mean, in other words, put another way, if we know that there are black men getting what they want because they have the money to do it, then it then it also follows that the black men who are not getting what they want, probably part of the reason is because they don't have the means to do it. But we, we agreed on that earlier, that it's a factor, but we don't right. know what percent, we don't know what the weight is of that factor. And see, that's the problem is that- If the average black man earns some, or median is somewhere around $40,000. Right. Um, and we know black women, and we know black women. I mean, we all know the one that made Kevin a household name, Miss Average at Best. When Kevin asked her, why can't you just get with an average guy? Her yeah. response was, and I quote, I can't respect an average guy. But that's not, I mean, that's yeah. not the and I don't know. Because I, I, here's, here's the thing, sitting, I can tell you myself, that same guy with that $40,000 in the Chicago area can easily scoop up a better looking Latina. Easily. I, I don't easily. I so so I, what I'm saying is I would not project I would not project their ignorance, their intellectual infirmity upon black men. That that this foolish woman can only tolerate being with, with the caliber of man who has no interest at all at being with her, that's her own mental illness. I would not project any responsibility of that onto black men, not in the least bit. Oh no, 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 I'm not projecting it. What I'm saying is, is that it goes to the to the to the argument. If we have black men, the majority of whom were able to pair off with black women, and they make that kind of money, which by the way, that that tracks with Kevin's argument, that the black men that he knows and that he frequents with, and so on and so forth, they want black women. Well, that that article tracks with that. But hold so, on, but hold on though, but hold on. But we also gotta go back though, because again, we know what the number is for peak earnings in America is at around 50, but the prime marriage age is 25 to 35. So most men in America, regardless of race, are not gonna hit that 100K range until their late 40s or early 50s. We know this. So right. if that's the basis, then you're gonna, so even if we take that woman's argument, well, they can't afford me, that means that most men in America, by American standard, wouldn't be able to afford her until she's until they're 50 and we know that he's not going to choose her 99% of the time based on the data we can also we we know that empirically so part of getting married is going off on faith is that if the prime marriage age is 25 to 35 it's a down payment on potential of where that man is at at that age so let's say he's got his college degrees and masters he's working on wall street maybe he's making 80k and he's at 30 years old and you can look at his projected earnings. So women have to make the investment. Either they're going to go for the older guy that's 50, but if they're going to get with the younger guy, they have to go based on what we can project over the course of time. See, that's another issue you have to bring up. Because again, even for what you're saying is true, we know that the man's wages go up and peak around 50. See, this is why black men have no business at all marrying those kind of women. Because see, here are the intangibles to what you described, uh, uh, King Sigma. That young man that marries that woman, whether or not he's able to actually ascend to that level of earning that six figures, will be dictated by the quality of life he's able to live with that woman. Will they be able to manage money together properly? Will he be able to focus on his work to succeed and to compete uh, in lieu of having to, to fight with, with some woman over some nonsense? Or, or is he going to have to deal with the fact that she's cheating on him? She's trying to spend all his money. You know, she has these outsized demands, material demands, that she, you've got to spend a hundred, several hundred dollars a month maintaining her hair and all this kind of nonsense. It's one thing to look at the man and the, the so-called, quote, potential of the man. Well, what is your potential to help the man get to the place? Or what is your potential to hinder the man from getting to the place? Hey, that's a good point because again, if we know that a man's prime age for marriage in America is 25 to 35, and most men want to marry a younger woman, so we're talking for the women, 
he's if he's 25 to 35, he's looking for a woman that's likely 18 to 26 kind of range. See, that's what I'm saying. So if, if the main factor is going to be his financial position in that range, then we're going to have a problem. Because again, that dude at 30, when you hit 30, his income is going up. But if those women don't want to make that investment with those guys, what you're going to have, they're going to get paired off with the older guys who are either married or unmarried. And then these younger guys are just going to stay single. And when they get to that point of being 50, they're going to want to be with the 20 one year old, 23 year old woman. So they're not even going to get married if that becomes. The or lead, they're going to marry black. smart, non black women, which yes, is what exactly. many of them are doing. Yes. And that's why I was saying that. That's why I don't disagree with obsidian that that number is still a minority. It's, it's unquestionable. It's still a minority. But what I'm telling him is based on being out here and my observation, that number is going to continue to grow by the time we get to that 2030 census. Because again, so many people are just doing long term hookup culture, short term hookup culture, and that's where they're at. And the more that your dating pool becomes non black women, the more likelihood you're going to end up marrying a non black woman. So, so, country. so you're at, so, so we have to look at where you're at. You're in Minnesota where, yeah, there's a very small black community or, or black population. The vast majority of black Americans live in the South that are heavily black populated. Yeah, that's a factor. Yeah, like I said earlier, the region regions is a factor. Where you at? That's a factor. But I'm hearing in the South that it's growing, that that number is picking up as well. I hear from a lot of brothers in the South that um, that the number down there is growing too. We'll see. And I'll have more to add to this, you know, next year because I'm going to be doing quite a bit of traveling around America. Um, you know, in 2022, I got I'm ready to do a lot of traveling to some cities I haven't been to, and I want to see what's really going on out there in the streets. But, you know. Unfortunately, it's just not a lot of information out there about black men um, feelings about marriage. And, 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 and black Uru is arguing the reason why is because the black male academics are shivering in their boots because of the potential uh, shockwave that the. Uh, I, I would not describe I, I would not describe it that way at all. I, I think many of those men are very smart, brave men and they work in an environment in which they're just not they don't get the support they need. You know, and they have family and they have their responsibilities and obligation. They have an incredible investment that they have made in their education, both in terms of time and, and probably hundreds of thousands of dollars and whatever. And I don't expect them to sabotage their future and their, their family's interests uh, on, you know, fighting against the edifice of the uh, feminist, uh, grossly feminist uh, educational system. Yeah, I, I mean, do that. the fact that. Dr. Curry had to go all the way to what Scotland? Exactly. That's insane to me. That's an indictment of the American educational system, of the entire American uh, university system that he had to do that. Curry is a brilliant, brilliant man. Any observation of him, any reading of his book, make that prove that to be so. And you have idiots throughout the country, many of them black women who have tenure in major universities throughout this country, spewing unsupported nonsense. Meanwhile, someone of his caliber, his esteem must leave the continent in order to get proper due for what he's done and what he's achieved. That's the enormity of what, what black men, black male academics is dealing with obsidian. If you look at what happened to Dr. Curry, you realize just how, how opposed to the interest, the particular interest of black men there is he's he's proof of that he's living proof of that yeah yeah i mean so so to me it just sounds like you know we have a lot of unanswered questions that are that they're not going to get answered tonight but i think it's um thought provoking um i appreciate you both sharing your ideas but i just think that uh from when we look at the population yeah. under 40 that's the more important population to me because the prime age is 25 to 35 so what men are doing in that age range, that's where we have to get more um, empirical data. We have to get the sociologists out there. They have to start talking to these young black men between 25 and 35 and asking them, why aren't you getting married? Or do you even want to be married? Because again, one of the options that's out there is that it's a lot of easy casual sex out here. And a lot of men just want sex anyways, because marriage isn't, they haven't seen that it offers anything too much more than just having a, a, a nice, compatible, casual sex partner. So I just think that until we get that research, 
it's gonna have a lot of brothers going back and forth with anecdotes and opinions because the information yeah. just is not enough empirical information out there. But you guys, it, last words, and I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to appreciate uh, uh, you uh, taking the time out, King Seeking. I appreciate it, and thank you, Black Uru. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks a lot, Obsidian. Um, we'll definitely have to uh, follow up on this uh, when you get some more data that you can send to me, and we can talk about it. Yep, yeah, to be continued. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate yes, it. Yes, sir. Black yeah, I, I just want to thank both of you all as well. Thanks for having me up, Sigma, and a pleasure talking with you. And a pleasure talking with you as well, Obsidian. So look forward thank to coming again soon. Yeah. All right, you brothers have a good okay. night. So um, let me catch a couple of these um comments before I get out of here because I don't want to neglect the chat and everything. Um. So let's see. Tur Battle says, "I predict in ten years, America will be finished with any form of Keisha leadership." Yeah, like I mean, it's pretty much a done deal that the Latinas and the Asian American women are going to play a huge role in uh, specifically the the politics and the gender politics. They're going to play a bigger role than ever over this next decade. That's that's for certain. Where do you see Black women in the twenty years from now? Well. For me, based on looking at the census where it's at right now, I see the black um, population in general shrinking and continue to shrink. And I think that based on what we know, that with the Asian Americans surpassing blacks in around 2035, and with Latinas, um, the Latino population already being somewhere between 20 to 25 percent of the population, we can suspect that by trends, they're going to be around 30 percent for sure. So with that, I think that their role is going to be more diminished. And the black numbers are just going to start to shrink even more as those numbers go up for those other groups, because there's going to be more and more men either not participating in the mating market at all or dating out. That number's going to increase and there's going to be more black women doing the same, too. So we're going to have like basically these three groups, those that stay within the, the, the um, ADOS lineage group mating. We're going to have those that's dating out. And then we're going to have a big population of people that are just asexual, I guess, you, quote unquote that they're not in the market at all. So that's another thing that needs to be looked into. What is the, the percentage of these men and women that are gonna just be out of the dating market completely by 2030? So I think that uh, the numbers are gonna diminish over the next 20 years. So that's the future I see. With blacks in America are gonna have less political um, influence because they've been surpassed by these other groups. And by 2030, now it'll be white population, Latino, Asians, somewhere around close to 15%, and Blacks will, they're probably going to either stay the same or decline as their trend go, continues. And then it'll just be Native Americans who are damn near extinct in America, less than a million. So they, I don't know how much longer the Native Americans got. So we'll probably be last once they're extinct in about 20 years at the rate that their uh, numbers are. Um, let me see. <laughs> Rabbit Proof Fence. Yeah, I saw that movie. It only takes like two generations to wash out the blackness, man. Um, if America becomes too much to bear, many will return back to Africa. Yeah, I think there's going to be a mixture of people, man. Like, So that's a hard question because you're talking about 40 million people in 2021. And if you take out the immigrants, it's probably close to like, what, 34 million blacks? So it's hard to say what they're going to do. But I think that um, ultimately the numbers is definitely gonna to continue to go down. The political influence is gonna to continue to go down as well. Those are two things I, that the trends say, that's a fact. But as far as like what the family structure is gonna look like, well, I mean, you already got six out of 10 black women raising eight out of 10 black children. That's, that's, that's critical. So if that trend continues, there's no reason to think that it wouldn't get closer to 80%. So I, I don't know, it's, it's a pretty bleak for the black majority, but again, the minority of blacks are gonna do fine. A quarter of blacks will just do what they've always done. So that's just, but for the black majority, it's a lot of unknowns, man. We just don't have enough information at this point. We just have trends. Um, Sir Battle says, East Indians and East Asians have created a new fabricated group. Yeah, they, and that was pretty surprising that their numbers doubled in 20 years. So that's why I had to do a stream on that because that surprised me. So that's a number that blacks that are concerned really need to be looking at. They're not paying enough attention to how these other groups are growing. And a lot of that's from people being imported. So when they have policies that are saying, hey, we're going to bring in 5 million or 500,000 of this group, 
those things are going to have real consequences for the next uh, 20 years, man. But I don't think enough people are invested. I know people give a lot of lip service to being invested, but if, if so many black Americans cared about these social problems and these trends, we wouldn't be having this discussion in 2021. Again, the Washington Post of all news outlets put out a report right before the election that said that black growth in the majority has been zero since 1965. Zero across the major economic indicators. And that came from the Washington Post. Matter of fact, let me see if I can find it before I get off here, because there might be people that want to look at it. But um, so I, I just I think it's a lot of lip service and I think people have good intentions. Don't get me wrong. Their heart's in the right place. But I think their commitment never matches the rhetoric, because if the commitment matched the rhetoric, the black population numbers would be on par with the Latinos or even more. So that's something to think about. Let's see if I can find an article before I get off here. Yep, here it is. Um, so let me bring this up for you all so you guys can just see it. You can look it up on your own later. But um, it's an important piece from the from the Washington Post, man. So unfortunately, Washington Post has a subscription thing, but you can see it um, in the background. It says black women uh, are black and white economic gap as wide as it was in 1968. So that was one of the uh, reports that the Washington Post put out. I guess they have a subscription thing now where you got to subscribe. But um, the other report said there was no growth economically since 1965. So the wage gap is the same and the economic growth is zero. So I just got to ask the question. I mean, at what point do we start being honest about it? If the commitment matched the rhetoric, the economic gap would not be the same. The black population numbers wouldn't be dwindling the way that they are. So I think that's a question that those that listen to those that have the most to say about these social problems, ask them, where's the real commitment? Where's the real results? But with that, I will let you guys go. Appreciate the brother Obsidian coming on and Black Yuru Speaks. Thanks to Edward Anderson um, for sparking this conversation. I just thought that it'd be good to, you know, get some more data out there because, again, the more data that we have on these conversations, the more, um, the better the conversation will be, but the more likely that you'll be to come to a solution. But as things stand, it's a lot more questions than there are answers. And with that, you, you guys all have a great weekend.